Ecological Engineering Society had a meeting in Tampa this past, when was that? June. June. June Junish. Yeah. And I gave a presentation with the same title. And some of the st uh, stuff you're going to see is the same. Uh, unfortunately, for those of you that were there, it's the same stuff. But uh, most of you weren't there. So this is all brand new to you. And um, so let's see what we got here. All right. So that first um, thing talks about 50 years of co-evolution of research, teaching, and, and policy. And it occurred to me that that's what's happening, uh, especially during the phosphate um, research that we were doing. Uh, the companies had no idea how to reclaim, and they were told they had to reclaim by the state. And so they started planting trees and pushing dirt, making essentially pastures with little clumps of trees in the center. And so um, we got re uh, money from the Florida Institute of Phosphate Research and began the process of figuring out how to make uh, some kind of a functional ecosystem. I won't say they, we've replaced ecosystem for ecosystem, but we, we made functional ecosystems and then taught the industry. And as we were doing that, the, uh, the people in Tallahassee, the regulators said, oh, you can do that? Okay, that's now a rule. And so every time we made an advance, the rules got, uh, they raised the bar on the rules. And so it was a co-evolution of regulation, research, and, and, and industry. So. Anyway, so uh, co-evolving components each exert selective pressure on the other. All right, <laughs> so systems and wetlands ecology, HDO started the program at UF in, in 1970 and founded the center in 73. In addition to that uh, groundbreaking wetlands research, we also uh, founded the disciplines of ecological engineering and ecological economics. So in 1973, the Endangered Species Act was passed the handheld mobile phone was invented. College tuition was about $358. The Miami Dolphins won the Super Bowl. Gas was 39 cents a gallon. <laughs> Arab oil embargo started in October and I finished my master's degree in architecture. <laughs> so if you don't know, that's me there. <laughs> All right, so the directors of the Center for Wetlands, H. T. Odom, of course, was the first director, then GRB, better known as the best, mm -hmm. and then uh, Tom Chrisman, and then there's M.T. Brown, and then there's David Kaplan here at the end. Another way of looking at that whole thing is this way. Hit me up. Yeah, And so there's the best. H. T. was asked by the engineering um, dean, they ask everybody to have a photo made that they can put on the, at that time they didn't have a web. So it was a photograph to put in the brochures and so forth in HD. He didn't have to change. He already had his, that suit and tie was always what he wore, no matter whether he was in the field or not. But he said, wait a minute. And he grabs up a bunch of dirt. He says, okay, now take my photo. <laughs> That's the photo, the original, the official photo for the uh, yeah, university. And uh, this guy here, this guy here. So doesn't that look like doesn't that look like I got this? I just got this. <laughs> anyway. So I see. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I you want to say you'll be like Can't do that modern technology. Okay, just stand up there. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Black and and orange blue. Oh, yeah. oh. Kathy Ewell was an intern, weren't you? Okay. But Ariel, <laughs> went, was that when he went to New Zealand? What was it when you became? 75. 75. Okay. Uh, you squeeze another picture. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, the next, I'll, for the next. Uh, for the <laughs> All right. So I saw four uh, research threads at, uh, no, actually three. 
<laughs> I changed it at the last <laughs> Uh, ecology and hydrology stuff, which was wastewater wetlands, stormwater treatment wetlands, spring ecosystems, and now harmful algae blooms. And the reason that's in red is because I know you're going to talk about it, and I'm not. Okay. And then <clears throat> restoring ecology, restoration ecology, mine lands and wetlands mitigation, and then environmental and public policy. And I had those two separated, and I kind of decided to put them together. Wetlands protection, wetlands assessment, environmental accounting, and then sustainable infrastructure. All right, so this is a research timeline for the center. Um, that at the bottom here are the years, of course, and these are all the projects. Um, and they are organized according to ecology, hydrology, or yellow, restoration is this kind of blue color, public policy is the white, and then environmental policy is the kind of pink salmon color. So you can see them graphic form. These are, um, there's no money attached to all that, but <laughs> there's a little over $50 million in 50 years, which is not bad for, for the center. And there's some tr interesting trends. First, this, this is huge blossoming of research. Uh, that's during our time. When it, we were adding a lot to the program and, and Clay was too. And then, of course, we have way too much money and way too many students and couldn't write proposals and didn't want to write proposals. And so then, boom, no <laughs> new process. And then it uh, starts to pick up. So I'm going to talk about wastewater wetlands, landscape restoration, wetlands buffer research, stormwater wetlands, uh, EMAP, LDI, WCI, WCA, and then environmental policy. So first of all, wastewater wetlands. Of course, it started with uh, Rockefeller Rand of uh, money uh, for Cypress wetlands for water management, recycling, and conservation from 1973 to 1980. Well, what was the brand? Hmm? Research. I know. I <laughs> Research applied to national needs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was the program in NSF. And then Rockefeller Foundation mm -hmm. matched, I think they matched the NSF. HT came to me, I was in uh, uh, architecture school, and he said, I need a graphic, big graphic. Again, there was no uh, PowerPoints or anything else. And he was going to carry a gigantic graphic with him to try and explain to a very large group of people uh, what this Cypress thing was all about. And so uh, he said, can you draw me? I want some pine lands on either side. I want a, a Cypress dome, and I want to see sewage coming in, and i got to have the aquifer down there. And so this was... Uh, what's um, the graphic um, that sold um, the project to an NSF. Uh, and that dome became uh, the symbol for the center for the last couple of years. The take home as a result of the center's research, the state of Florida changed regulations to allow the use of natural and constructive wetlands for wastewater recycle. And of course, it fostered wetlands, um, uh, the use of wetlands throughout the United States. And <clears throat> we started working. I develop a simulation model that I used to try to size wetland systems. Um, and then we started designing wetlands all over the state, you know, some of them which were built, some of which were not. Um, this was my idea for a wetland slough in South Dade County after Hurricane Andrew had opened up a lot of land. I said, why don't we put back the finger glades and uh, allow the Everglades, Everglades to flow, flee, flow free. <laughs> Uh, I was I was told that that was the stupidest idea uh, anyone had ever heard of. You can't change. You can't go backwards. You got to go forwards. So, uh, Lake Apopka respiration, uh, respiration. Yes, restoration. The Sunny Hill Farm, Oklawaha restoration, and then the Iron Bridge treatment wetland. That uh, we were flying in a helicopter. Uh, uh, money was uh, the paid paid by Orange County, right? Uh, right. The orange or uh, yeah, orange, yeah, I think orange county <clears throat> flying all over the eastern part of, of uh, Orange County looking for sites. And we saw this site and we said, that looks like the perfect site. It's close to the uh, St. John's. We sat down in a pasture and got out and we're kind of walking around. And this guy drives up and he's the owner. And he says, what are you doing here? And he said, well, we're thinking about proposing a, a, a wetland system here. We'll buy your land. And he goes, really? <laughs> <laughs> because 
he was land rich, but money poor. I mean, and it wasn't good uh, cattle. Land. It was too wet. The cows were getting fat on water, but not putting on any. Anyway, <clears throat> the bottom line was, I think he made three and a half million dollars. And I asked him just for a 10% finders. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get it. <laughs> anyway, total that we designed about 3,500 acres of treatment wetlands throughout the state of Florida. So restoration, uh, over 30 years, a series of projects funded by the Florida Institute of Phosphate Research. Um, it was amazing. It was a, a state agency. It was, the money was from a severance tax on phosphate, and it was a lot of money. And so it kept um, many of the people in this room <laughs> got their degrees having worked on uh, those phosphate projects, a lot of stuff. So the first one I did was uh, using donor wetlands, the muck from donor wetlands to see if you could create new wetlands. And of course, uh, there's plenty of uh, uh, organic or uh, uh, seeds and propagules and so forth in that, that uh, we got back uh, wetland pretty quickly, uh, primarily uh, herbaceous wetland. Uh, and then we got this big one, the development of techniques and guidelines for reclamation of phosphate mine lands. And it, uh, we studied the physical and biological characteristics of Florida native ecosystems and, we, uh, and some naturally reclaimed lands. And we developed a handbook. Um, the main thing here was that um, we collected and analyzed an unprecedented amount of data on the structure and drivers of wetland ecotone mm -hmm. open systems 52 belted transects, transects totaling 23 kilometers in length. And all of the soils, vegetation, groundwater, um, and over a period of three years. So there was a huge amount of data. We stored it on Bernoulli disks. <laughs> Have you ever heard of Bernoulli? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> a couple of people have. The data's gone, completely gone because it was on a, a disk that doesn't exist, in, a drive in a disk that doesn't exist. Okay, then uh, the state of, you know, the state regulators, a lot of them were from Tallahassee uh, and educated at FSU, and therefore they were educated good biologists, but not good systems ecologists. And so they kept saying things like, those nuisance species, nuisance species, typha, primrose willow, are gonna, hold back the successional development of these wetland systems that are so important. And we kept saying, no, you know, shade kills uh, early successional species. So we had to go prove it. So we had to get a project funded to show that if you shade out early successional fun uh, sun loving species, they die. So we did, and it worked. The shade kills early succession species. And then, they still weren't satisfied. They're stealing the nutrients so that there's no way that the, the, the plants that we want to have are going to actually survive because they're stealing the nutrients. So uh, <clears throat> uh, primarily Christina Jackson, but Susan Karsten and others, and Kelly, all of them were part of that study. And the bottom line there was early successional species are very good at sequestering nutrients and making them available to piece the species that you all right. Then we did a project on successional trajectories. Susan Karsten was the primary driver on that. And the best predictor of long-term success, this is Clay Montague's suggestion for a, 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 a you don't probably don't remember it, but you were meeting with Susan and you said, is this what you're talking about? <laughs> so it wound up being part of the project. The greatest predictor for long-term success was soil organic uh, matter accumulation, of course. So if you measure that, that alone, you have a good idea of, of where you are on this uh, curve of where you want to be, uh, whether it's total biomass or whether it's species diversity or whatever, uh, organic matter in the soil is the best predictor of that. How am I doing on time? <clears throat> 15 minutes. Oh, good. Uh, then we had a project, because there was proliferation of, of clay settling areas, and of course you can't build anything on clay settling areas, and so they were wondering, well, maybe they, we could say that they're going to be good for wetlands. So we had a project that ran for a number of years, uh, 
Mary Boyd, Ingerson, uh, Tim King, and uh, I mean, Sean King and, and Dave McLaughlin, Daniel McLaughlin. <clears throat> and a lot of different aspects to it. And Daniel got his PhD of uh, continuing the work, but uh, we developed a concept of hydro pattern to include not only the duration, but also the depth, because that's so important when you're trying to figure out what the plant where. It's not how long it's going to be wet, but what depth of their inundation. Both of those are really important things. Of course, depth and duration are somewhat related. Anyway, and then the wetlands buffer research from 19, what was that, 1987 to 1995. The first one we did uh, was wetland buffers for the Wakaiva Basin. <clears throat> and uh, very controversial. And then we added to it um, uh, buffer zones for water wetlands and wildlife in East Central Florida. So uh, sponsored by the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council. <clears throat> the bottom line, buffer widths vary between 75 and 300 feet, depending upon site-specific soil and groundwater conditions. Quality. The idea was to protect wetlands from upland development and how much of a buffer did you need between the development and the wetlands. So you can imagine going to the development community and saying, we not only are not allowing you to do, uh, develop these wetlands, but we want 300 feet on the upland side of it. So it didn't go over very well. Joe Schaefer, <clears throat> who was instrumental in all this, he's a wildlife guy, uh, was in the wildlife department here. He was called on the carpet in IFAS by the dean saying, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? And Joe wouldn't back down. <clears throat> Joe is no longer at the University of Florida. <laughs> he is, no, he is with the University of Florida. He's no longer in Gainesville. They moved him to um, Bell Glade. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't back down. <clears throat> the Econ Lakachi uh, was the one where he got called on the carpet. The big one because it was a lot of it was agriculture and um, cattle and <clears throat> the cattlemen were really upset that they were going to lose land. Joe said, you know, if you want wet, if you want wildlife, you can't have the cattle in there too. Right? So, and then we did a Tomoka and Spruce Creek riparian habitat protection. So refinement and science backstarting uh, for the regulation plans immediately adjacent to spring. All right. Stormwater wetlands from 1994 to 2012. <clears throat> the very first one, uh, David Tilley and Joel Dudas, uh, sponsored by the South Florida Water Management District, the South Dade Watershed Project. Uh, this is South Dade, <laughs> believe it or not. <clears throat> this is Biscayne Bay over here. And modeling, we determined um, that uh, stormwater management, that mimic natural mimic natural wet watersheds rather than engineered conveyance systems provided excellent water quality. And in addition, dampened extreme flows. So the idea was lots of small wetlands, treatment wetlands, some medium-sized uh, 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 treatment wetlands, and then the large one at the very bottom of the watershed. That's the dampening. These are all treatment. That, that takes care of mostly uh, phosphorus. This is uh, sediment, and that's uh, hydrology. Uh, uh, the Arch Creek retrofit, uh, a, an urban watershed. This is, uh, you may not be able to recognize it, but those are all houses, thousands of houses all throughout here. And there was a creek uh, back in the day before the houses. We found old area photographs and we were able to establish where the creek was. And that's the uh, um, wetland area around that creek. When they built those houses back in the late 40s and early 50s, all they did was just fill it in. All right. And so there was a natural depression there where water would uh, stand. And so we said, oh, we're just going to make a stormwater park. Nobody had ever done it before. But the idea was we're going to put back all of that. The green is park. And it would be storage when it floods. It would just flood out over that area and then shrink back down and, and go on out the, um, <clears throat> the creek. And then these are increased density, taking all the people that were there before and putting them back, but at an increased density. We presented this to Miami Dade City Commission. And what I learned was society was not ready to replace. <laughs> 
housing with a stormwater park. They, you know, it was one of those th same things. Boy, you're drinking rag rarefied air. <laughs> you're breathing rag rarefied air. You can't do that. Well, now they're doing it all over. We did spatial modeling in um, the St. Mark's watershed, and we showed, of course, um, that uh, water uh, wetland stormwater treatment areas and BMPs, if designed correctly, could reduce pollutant loads by as much as 45% like St. Mark's and the Wakala River. <laughs> Uh, EMAP, LDI, so forth. So EMAP is the Environmental Monitoring Assessment Protocol. LDI is the Landscape Development Intensity Index. WCI is the Wet Condition Index. And w NWCA is the National Wetlands Condition Assessment. So um, this study was a precursor to EPA's Environmental Monitoring Assessment Program. So they gave us some seed money. Uh, Ronnie, remember this? This is when I backed into something with your Red uh, blazer, blazer and yeah. destroyed the back end of the <laughs> and that, uh, Anyway, this was the beginning of all of that work that uh, you'll report on as well. So, um, and then we developed uh, this uh, idea of so, biological. Is that, is that backing? Um, is that part of the human disturbance training? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big disturbance. <laughs> But bless his heart, he just said, okay, it's okay, it's okay. And Ronnie always would. <laughs> so we developed a, a wetland, uh, <clears throat> I, lost, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> wetland condition index um, using the LDI, Landscape Development Intensity Index, and showed that as, as development increased in intensity, the quality of the wetlands that were surrounded by, or uh, that were being surrounded, uh, continue to decline. And that um, WCI became the basis for most of the work that the EPA is doing now on, on, on condition assessment. So <clears throat> trying to move through. And then this is the EPA, and you're going to say more about this mm -hmm. one. So it's Florida's participation in the National Wetland Condition Assessment, and it's uh, still ongoing. So every five years, there's a team of people from the center goes out and collects a large quantity of data on how many wetlands are they doing? 50 to 60. 50 to 60, yeah. all over the state of Florida in weird places. So the, the, uh, the, the WCA is a, co a collaborative uh, survey of U.S. wetlands. The NWCA examines the chemical, physical, and biological activity. Okay. Environmental policy research. Phew. You're doing great. Okay. The effects of herbicide in South Vietnam. So I was finishing my master's degree. Odom got this project uh, funded by the Department of Defense to look at um, the impact of Agent Orange on um, mangroves in Vietnam because they were particularly susceptible. Uh, one spraying seemed to kill them all. And so the Runsat, which was the, the uh, where the Mekong River flows out into the Gulf, um, was barren uh, with all of the Agent Orange that they had sprayed. And Odom got a little piece of that, and as Odom always did, he put a whole bunch of people and answered way more questions than the Department of uh, 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 Defense wanted answered. Maury Sell was down, believe this or not, Maury Sell was down in um, uh, Collier County killing mangroves with Agent Orange <laughs> in order to see what the effects were, how many times you had to spray it, and so forth. Uh, without the knowledge of, of the state of Florida. <laughs> My job was to do a model of Vietnam at war. And that's it. That's the diagram for the model. <laughs> and uh, I predicted, uh, among other things, a model of war that predicted South Vietnam would fall to North Vietnam if the US pulled out its troops and aid. It's one of the only times my model was correct. <laughs> It worked. <laughs> All right. And of course, the biggie was the carrying capacity for man and nature in South Florida began in 1975. Um, and I got Odom and Brown et al. There are many, many, many people that uh, contributed to this study. The maps that are still hanging on the wall in the center were done by myself, Bob Costanza. Joy Bartholomew was uh, our colorist. If you look at those maps, there are nine different greens. All right. Now, this is before computers. 
All right. And so we need a colorist. And so Joy was in landscape architecture and she said, I know a little bit about color. I said, all right, we need nine greens. And she came up with nine greens. And the, the whole thing is, uh, is energetics. Um, the lightest is the lowest productivity. The darkest is the highest, uh, highest productivity. Green, of course, is nature. Yellow and brown is agriculture. Or orange and purple is, is uh, urban. So you look at it, you see the pattern of South Florida and all of the energetics that are there. They were hand painted by a group of, I got uh, undergraduates out of geography because they were good map makers. And we used hypodermic needles and we'd fill them with paint and then you'd squeeze them. I mean, because there's tiny little things. Well, we learned soon that it was not a good idea to give undergraduate students a hypodermic needle with a point because they kept tattooing themselves, <laughs> inadvertently tattooing themselves. So Bob came up with this idea of cutting the tip off. So it was no longer sharp, it was now blunt like this, but still, that's how they all got painted. <clears throat> we employed a whole bunch of them. All right, it was funded by the US Department of the Interior in response to the proposed jet port in the Everglades. It contained recommendations for population carrying capacity and the appendix of over 60 evaluated ecosystem diagrams. One of the biggest things that was said was free the Everglades, put in a channel of restored Everglades and allow it to flow from the lake on down to Florida Bay. No one would listen until <laughs> we almost got it done when, um, uh, sugar, uh, Florida sugar, Florida sugar, is that what they were called? I don't know. They went up to the governor and said, we can't stand all of these regulations. And, and the governor said, we'll buy it. We'll buy you out. And they said, two minutes. <laughs> and they said, okay, we'll do it. And so the state of Florida was in the process of buying all that sugarcane land south of Everglades and the 2008 recession crashed the economy and it didn't happen. It's unfortunate, unfortunate. Natural systems and care, that's, that's then spurned a bunch of care and capacity, another one. And then <clears throat> the Arab oil embargo brought on a real interest in net energy. And so there was the net energy analysis of alternatives for the US and then energy basis for the United States and then an, a manual for using energy analysis for plant uh, siting. And then the Cousteau projects. And I got a phone call one day from this guy, his name was Richard Murphy. And he says, this is Richard Murphy. I'm vice president for education and uh, science and education for the Cousteau Society. How would you guys like to go on expedition with us? So this is a crank call. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, HT was um, on sabbatical and Joni, Reese said, uh, you know, call Mark Brown. And so uh, I said, sure, we'd be happy to. And that started, uh, uh, what is that? Eight year, uh, eight year uh, incredible opportunity for a bunch of graduate students. Uh, Bob Worth was uh, in Alaska with us. I got to tell this story on Bob. <laughs> We're driving down and it's, you know, the land of the midnight sun, right? So it's probably two or three o'clock in the morning, but the sun's out bright, he's driving. I'm in the um, uh, shotgun and you're in the back seat and we're driving along this road. It's only this wide and there's just nothing on this side and mountain on this side. And I'm sound asleep and I hear, we're gonna die and it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> there's a truck passing another truck and in our lane coming right at us. And I still don't know how. I don't know how you did it. <laughs> but he wanted to make sure that when I went when I went to wherever I was going, that I wasn't going to hold it against you. <laughs> not ridiculous, dying though. <laughs> anyway, we were all over the place. And I traveled with the Custodes collecting an amazing amount of data sharpening the energy analysis methods and providing environmental policy to governments throughout the world. I nearly drowned in Papua New Guinea and was almost eaten by a whale in Mexico Sea of Cortez. <laughs> the USDA project, Elliot Campbell was, a, Campbell was the primary student on that. 
And it was Ariel Lugo that provided the funds or, or instituted the funds for us to do this project. Uh, it was an incredible uh, fair. We came up with incredible amounts of money, what the National Forest Service was worth. We were just talking about it a moment ago. The environmental services of the forest system totaled $3 trillion a year. And the environmental assets were worth $44 trillion a year. And the budget is what, $3 billion or something? Five. $5 billion. And so the idea was, look what you're, what's, what you're getting for your money and protecting all of that. So the, the Forest Service director liked these large numbers and she started going around talking about them. And then her economists got a hold of her and they said, no, this is voodoo economics. That study was shelved as you. And then an NSF Agri program and adaptive management where we trained um, 26 PhD fellowships in four cohorts of students. We took them to Africa every summer. Um, and that was another amazing opportunity. That's so much fun <laughs> and learned so much and, and produced an incredible and great PhD students. And then uh, US EPA gave us money in 2011. Um, Chris DeVildis was a student on it to develop um, uh, co a comprehensive list of unit energy values or transformities, you may know them from that, for the elementary flows that can be used in life cycle inventory framework. Mm -hmm. In all, we computed 200 UEVs that will become the basis for standardized energy evaluations in the future. And then finally, none of this worked. Oh, we didn't get the latest slide. That's okay. <laughs> this morning, I added one more study, and I, 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 but I, you weren't there to get it. So, so none of this work would have been possible without the dedication and hard work of approximately 230 master's and PhD students. There they are. And if you look at it, um, Let's see, these are HT, <clears throat> uh, these are brown, <laughs> and these are, are yours. You want to know my... yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> this is you. Yeah. That's, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. HT, you, and me, and uh, okay. I'm making mistakes. <laughs> As well as over 100 UF faculty who have supported and collaborated with center students, and here they all are. Um, find the name somewhere. And, and finally, the center has been enriched by a huge number of visiting students, scholars, collaborators, associates. And there they are. Huge number. David Science Man is probably the weirdest of them. <laughs> All right, we'll have we have time for maybe one or two questions while we switch over the presenter. Um, wetland regulation and protection over the decades has vacillated it's been a roller coaster up and down, especially by ACO. Um, is there any way to sever the connection between good science and politics? <laughs> Uh, Who's that for? <laughs> I really don't know how to answer. That. Good science leads to politics. Ask Larry Schwartz. Uh, yeah. It's well, unfortunately, the longer, the more patient we are, it seems the worst things. Are we don't help. We don't. They follow the rules of the top. That's right. Yeah. Um, a good scientist. Good science comes from good scientists, and good scientists are not supposed to. be. Thank you, Albert. Wow, that's incredible. Center for Wetlands is amazing. Everybody in this room is amazing. It's good to see so many of you I haven't seen in a long time. Um, so I wanted to really honor Dr. Odom Sell for two uh, aspects that, uh, two things that he started that really shaped my whole life. Those were his springs research and his treatment wetlands research. Uh, those are the two paths that I followed in my very careers over time. Uh, I first met Dr. Odom as a, at, for my undergraduate, um, senior undergraduate course in systems ecology at Chapel Hill, just before he left Chapel Hill and moved uh, back to Gainesville in 1970. And then that summer I got to work with him at Moorhead City, uh, actually studying marsh, receiving a salt marsh, receiving 
municipal wastewater. So I actually worked on the first treatment wetland project that I know of in the United States, even before Bob Cadillac got started up in Michigan. Uh, so I always gave Bob a hard time about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then um, I eventually followed Dr. Odom up here in 1977 and did Silver Springs, got to restudy Silver Springs, one of the, his last really aquatic ecology studies that he was uh, directing. And, and that then set up a career that I'm in now, which is in the Springs Institute. Uh, but in between, I did a lot of other things. So I want to honor the, the springs and the wetlands part of Dr. Odin and just give a little bit of background about him because I know some of you probably never met at Dr. Odin. And, uh, and of course, many of us have, and, and some have spent almost their whole life with him, Mark, as, uh, as you and some of the other lucky ones have. He was born in Chapel Hill, um, and his brother, uh, E.P. Odom, who wrote the book on ecology, um, was a role model for him. The two of them were bird watchers, and they spent a lot of time uh, watching birds. And, uh, and he published a number of articles in the chat, the North Carolina birding, little birding magazine. Um, he started undergraduate work during the Second World War, and that was interrupted by the Second World War. He joined the Air Force as a cadet and then came back and finished his bachelor's degree in 46. He then went directly to Yale under G. Evelyn Hutchinson, the most famous limnologist of all time, and who, where, where he got his PhD. And he didn't always see eye to eye with Hutchinson. That's Odom had his own brain. And mm -hmm. he learned a lot there. And then he came to the University of Florida in 1950. And of course, he's, he came to Florida and looked around and said, what's neat about this place? You know, I, this, this brilliant guy, he comes to Florida. And he had uh, stayed in Florida before because his father had a place down in Winter Park or somewhere like that. And so Odom had gotten familiar with the turtles and the fish stuff of the springs. When he came back to Florida, he said, I want to study the springs. And he got uh, U.S. Navy grants for four years to study Silver Springs. And he ended up going to over 40 springs and left notes on those springs about what he saw and what he, what he observed, the, the plants and animals. Uh, and then he went to uh, Duke. Uh, he wrote his monograph on springs and published in 57, the ecological monographs. He went to Duke, and I have no information about what he did at Duke. So if anybody can describe what Odom did at Duke, maybe Kathy or Mark, maybe you know. Uh, but I don't know why he left there so quickly. He was only there about two years and went to the Institute of Marine Sciences, where he did these bay studies, these uh, shallow estuary studies uh, that I think really informed him a lot about uh, how these large systems were working. And then Puerto Rico for the uh, aerial loop, was that, uh, you know, you're here, was, were you part of that study? That, yeah. Yes, and uh, so that's good. We have firsthand information on that. And then the University of North Carolina for four years, back to Florida, and he died in 2002. So mm -hmm. uh, that's the man. Okay, find the guy with a shitting and grin on his face and you'll <laughs> found Dr. Odom, uh, there's the man. <laughs> Uh, here he is, a cadet in the Air Force. I mean, he, all of you who studied him, studied with him, especially environmental meteorology and stuff, he learned so much from studying the big, about studying the big picture from being in the Air Force and flying into the hurricanes and understanding how storms generate, how they maximize power, how they, you know, are autocatalytic mm -hmm. in nature and stuff like that. It really uh, taught him a lot. And, uh, and like I said, in terms of springs, he, he had his own research study. He had at least 25 colleagues with him when he did his Silver Springs study uh, that are published with him uh, in various places in their annual reports. And then uh, when he came back to Florida, he went down to Silver Springs and he said, what's going on here? I don't see any fish. And it, it, he noticed it right away. And he was taking classes down there uh, periodically. And um, he knew I was coming back because I, I been with him in 1970 and told him I was going to come back. And he, so he sort of saved Silver Springs for me. And I got to go out there for three years and repeat a lot of what he had done, which was really an eye-opening experience for me to see that ecosystems really did perform the way he taught us in systems ecology. These, these were highly complex interacting systems with energy flows and form and function that you needed to understand both to understand the system. And, um, uh, Elizabeth McMahon prepared this picture for the book that Mark is a co-author on it, uh, and about the, the structure of Silver Springs. This is the structural things are what you see when you go out there in a glass bottom boat, but they don't tell you anything about the function. And when the USGS came out there to try to improve their flow measurements, 
they decided they were going to cut the grass in Silver Springs along a transect so they could get good flow measurements that weren't influenced by all that nasty grass, right? It grew back every month. And I said, well, all he had to do was read Odin's paper. He said it replaces itself eight times a year is what his functional studies had shown. And, and indeed, that, Spart uh, that Sagittaria, which is the dominant there, was replacing itself eight times a year. It was, it was being eaten by turtles. It was being kicked up by glass bottom boats. And, <laughs> and everything in the system can be measured as a function as well as a, as a structure. And, and that I really learned from that. And, and Dr. Odom started putting that together for the first time. And that's what's so neat about his Silver Springs paper and his early work. This is from one of his early reports. Uh, the energy flows, you know, this is, it's ecosystems. In fact, all systems are just flows of energy and structural uh, components interacting with each other in certain ways. And there's properties that are common to all systems. And so he came up with that. And then he came up with this. And, and Mark, I think, had the best drawing ability of any student of Odom's. This is one of Mark's diagrams for a, a spring. This is the complex diagram of Silver Springs. And we never tried to simulate this one. I wonder why. <laughs> Uh, a lot of lot of unknown uh, parameters in there, but uh, it's it's great because with the language that Odom developed, the energies language, uh, you could describe any system from atoms to cosmos, and uh, that that was really neat. And when I got back to Silver Springs, actually, once again, thanks to Mark, uh, in the early two thousands, uh, DEP had the Springs Initiative, and they wanted to do a a retrospective study of Silver Springs with the St. John's River Water Management District. Mark was too busy, I think, Mark, with what it was, and he recommended me, I believe, is what happened. And so I, I was a consultant at the time when we got the, the project. So I got to go out for another full year uh, every month and collecting the same kind of data that I collected in the 70s, that I collected in the 50s. And we got to put together a pretty complete picture on an ecosystem with real good baseline data and then intermediate data and then current data. And the rapid, the rate of change of the ecosystem was amazing between those time intervals. In the first 25 years, when I studied it in the 70s, the metabolism was almost exactly the same as it had been during Odin's time. It was a little bit less. Uh, and But the structure was all there, except for the fish. The fish were gone. 60% of the fish population were mm -hmm. gone. And yet the system was still functioning pretty much the way it has, although it's like I said, his productivity was about 10 or 15% lower. When we bet, went back in 2004 and five, productivity was down further. Uh, the fish were down 90%. Uh, the plants had converted to algae uh, and it was just a different ecosystem in so many ways. And the, the drivers were a reduced flow of about 25% reduction in flow and an increased nitrate concentration. There was really nothing else in water quality or in physical nature of the system that had changed. It was those two parameters, which are the ones that I continue to chase after in all the spring studies. It cut the flow back. Whenever you put another permit in for another pumping well, you're cutting back the flow of the springs. And that affects the springs. I'm, I'm sure there's a one-to-one -one effect. And then whenever you allow excessive use of nitrogen on the landscape, especially in karst areas, you get nitrate pollution leading to horrific algal blooms. Uh, so this allowed me to write my, uh, my, one of my opuses, uh, Silent Springs, about the work that I got to do in the springs. And, uh, and I'll get back to that. But anyway, Dr. Odom, this was his vision. Uh, he and I tried to do this. We actually sent a letter to the president of the university, President Marston, uh, saying we wanted some money to start an institute, a springs institute. And we got a wonderful letter back, said no. And, uh, and that was it. It didn't, it didn't happen. And, uh, and so for the whole latter part of my life, the retired part of my life, I've been wanting a Springs Institute. And um, I've got one now. Uh, so in 2010, we started the Howard T. Odom Florida Springs Institute. It's located in High Springs. We've got um, some people in the room here out working, Paul, and, um, and others. Uh, we have a lot of functions. We're ed a nonprofit education and science institute. And uh, we collaborate wherever we can with universities and uh, with any anybody that's doing good science. And we go out and butt heads with the, the state politicians that are making, uh, enfor not enforcing the laws, I should say. Uh, and this is our, our mural in High Springs that you'll see when you go to the Itchituckney on Sunday. 
um, you'll drive by this the op opposite way and you come back. That's our old office. We have a new office now. It's called the Florida Springs Welton Center. It's on Main Street, just over from uh, the Great Outdoors Restaurant. And you've all been invited, <laughs> everybody going on the itch Tucking trip has been invited to stop by there for a quick lunch and refreshments. And can I have a show of hands of how many people are planning to do that? Can somebody count for me, please? Uh, leave them up for just a minute. Call it seventeen. We'll go twenty. Oh, at least twenty. I'll I'll get enough refreshments for twenty or twenty-five. You're welcome to change your mind and come. But I'd like you to see the Florida Springs Welcome Center and what we're doing. We actually have a repository of Dr. Odom's memorabilia, is what we're calling it. His his uh, antiquities, uh, like mm -hmm. his Buddha from China and. Uh, it's uh, a number of your dissertations and things like that, the originals, as well, well as the original copy of ecological monographs and things like that. So, um, so Wellens, well, this is crazy. I had to make a living after I graduated in 1980, and uh, I did a postdoc with Odom on the Crystal River Project, wrap, wrapping that up, uh, but I couldn't make a living doing that, so I went got into an, an consulting instead of academics. It was a path diverged in the woods and uh, there were no academic jobs at the time, Ark had taken the best one. And, uh, <laughs> and so I went off the other direction of consulting. I'm, I, don't, I don't regret it at all because I got to uh, apply what Dr. Oden started with the treatment wetland technology. We, uh, I've worked on at least 400 projects in treatment wetlands. I spent 34 years uh, working on them, improving the design principles. And we got a lot of information out of the Iron Bridge wetlands that Mark helped design Mark and, Ronnie, I know, designed that, and uh, it was an incredible system. Still is. If you haven't been there, you should visit it uh, down in Christmas, Florida. Uh, but that information allowed us to take this, and and Dr. Oderman really, really started dabbling in this at Moorhead City when he was at University of North Carolina. He set up marine ponds. He mixed saltwater and wastewater together in marine ponds and looked at the dynamics of the ecosystems. And a whole slew of graduate students that aren't here today. Are, are there any students here at that time? John Day, Hank McKellar, uh, Walt Boynton, uh, all these people were there at Chapel Hill at that time. When I was there, I would have had like a dozen PhD students, and uh, they were all working on that project. And okay. What? Okay, and they did for a while, yeah, on the Crystal River project, pretty much. Uh, and so I caught the end of the Crystal River project. I missed the Cypress Stone project completely, but when I went into consulting, the company I was working for did water and wastewater. So immediately there were opportunities to apply wetlands treatment in Florida, which we ended up doing. And uh, and this diagram, which is similar to the one that Mark showed, but this is out of one of the reports, uh, is, is just the answer to the future in Florida is that we're, we're discharging wastewaters that have elevated nitrogen levels all over the state of Florida still <laughs> and into land, what they call land treatment systems that actually don't remove the nitrogen. And when you look at the monitoring wells from dozens of those systems, you'll find that many of them have elevated nitrate and, and some are way above 10 parts per million. They don't, land treatment doesn't work in at least certain areas of Florida where it's karst. Uh, and so the idea of making using wetlands to recharge our treated wastewaters, wetlands remove all the nitrogen. I mean, go to Iron Bridge, the total nitrogen is 0.8 mm -hmm. coming out of the Iron Bridge. 0.8, and you can't find that in nature. Um, but uh, that water then infiltrates and recharges the aquifer. Perfect solution to our, our springs issues. And, and once again, I got to work with the, the best, Robert Cadleck, who same time Odom was getting started, he was starting at University of Michigan on treatment wells. And uh, the Cypress Dome project was going on at the same time that the Houghton Lake project was going on in Michigan. And, and they were together at conferences and stuff. Uh, and I'm almost done. And so Florida is overrun with treatment wetlands now. Not all Center for wetland, Wetlands, but a lot. Uh, but we use the Iron Bridge data a lot for the STAs in South Florida. There's over 50,000 acres of stormwater treatment area wetlands in South Florida now. And uh, one of our newest wetlands is Sweetwater well in here in Gainesville, which uh, we, uh, Debbie and I got to work on the design on that. And uh, the shape of an alligator's head, if you can't notice that. so. Yeah. To honor University of Florida, uh, that came from Jones Edmonds, and uh, Brett's not here, right? Okay, but some some of the Jones Edmonds guys are here, um, and this this wetland 
uh, remove several hundred thousand pounds of nitrogen a year. It was cheaper to build a wetland at the end of the Main Street uh, Sweetwater Branch project than it was to uh, do the nitrogen removal added wastewater treatment plant. Lots, lot cheaper. And this is what it looked like when we planted it. Uh, and then uh, groundwater recharge well and the Green K well in South Florida. This is these two things really don't go together except that that is like the Cadillac treatment well in the world is the the Green K well. It's just amazing. And Jim helped with that, and I helped with permitting it. Um, but it's it's just incredible. It's, it only discharges to the ground. It's a groundwater discharge well, just the way Odom envisioned. So Dr. Odom had this all together. I mean, by the time I met him, he was already publishing his first book, Energy Power and Society. He had this all figured out. Uh, it was just amazing for me. It changed my life totally to meet him, to have a systems ecology course, that to get to work with him as a graduate student, and ultimately I get my PhD with him. So uh, thank you, Dr. Odom. Love you. We had some time for questions for, for Bob. So we get Jason up here. Here. And although you contract it out and it's done within the parameters of the park itself, it spreads beyond that and it's interesting, especially with the high water levels now, um, way out onto the Okay, uh, as Dr. Odom would say, it's self designed. <laughs> uh, you know, water hyacinth is, is essentially endemic in Florida now. It's going to be here forever. Uh, and I, I don't even agree with spraying it out there. I think uh, you get better water quality benefits by actually leaving it out there. But I'm not running the Sweetwater Wetland. I, I wish I was. That would be a great retirement is to be in charge of running that well. But uh, I, I, Corny is not, a, not your enemy. Well, it displaces and um, reduces um, openings. It displaces and Well, I know, but that there's what's bad about that is my question. Anyway, that's it's a it's a philosophy question more than a science question. Yeah, but we have a philosopher coming up here. Yeah. Are you going to talk about water lands? Yeah, that was a great question, Carrie. Thank you. Well, that's great. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Really appreciate it. That was another Okay, right, Dr. Jason Evans from the Stetson University's Institute for Water and Environmental Resilience, another right. famous alum. All right, God. Well, thank you so much. And then, so the title here, so this is actually a true story, and it's being taped, right? It's recorded, but if you need any editing. Okay, good, good, good. So, so yeah, I'm actually here on the dime of the university today, and I'm like, I'm going to go talk about the Water Institute at UF, which I am, and you guys can swear I'm going to right? So there's a picture of the Water Institute. We're going to talk about Stetson briefly. So who's been to Stetson and Delane? Has anyone been there? So how's this work? This way? Big, big, big way. All right, there we go. Okay, yeah, so Stetson University, we claim to be the oldest university in the state. There's arguments about that. Rollins and Florida Southern, I think. So... Um, so a private university with about 2,300 students. We also have a law school. Um, and so the Institute for Water, so we founded this 2015. They hired me in 2014. And us, uh, so Mark, uh, you helped me get the job there. Thank you for your letter. Um, you want a 10% finder's fee. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> uh, and so uh, they hired me in there. We want to but we want to do this institute for the environment. So let's put resilience in there. That's going to be a really big thing. And so, um, and so what we do is we basically are doing the center for what? You know, we're looking at policy, we're looking at water, we're looking at philosophy, and we're kind of putting this all together. Then we're taking Stetson out into the world. Um, and so this is the aquatic center. This is my lab. So we're right here on Lake Beresford. This is Hontoon Island. It's a wonderful spot. Um, and so when I showed up and I was not yet the director and they're like, we're so excited. We got this building. I'm just an assistant professor trying to get tenure. And I show up and this is what I see. And I'm like, okay, we have a water institute. We've got this pond with a freaking fountain. <laughs> no, that's not, that's not going to work. So uh, we got a grant. We got the Yay. And um, so we've got some floating wetlands. We've got a rain garden area back there. It's actually stormwater wetland, but they're like, that doesn't sound, it's called a rain garden and it doesn't really have to trade, but that's okay. 
So we plan it all along the side there. It's a wonderful place to hang out. Okay. With students out there working, we're training students about wetlands, alligators, alligators like this pond, it's great. So loads of fun, uh, so want to come visit, please do. But now something completely different, right? So here's a fan of python here, right? So I was like, put this together. I'm like, I could talk about this for 10 minutes. Boring. So yeah, we're talking about water rats, right? So floating plants, floating plants, right? And so, uh, all right, so my life, it actually comes full circle even more because when I showed up here, um, so I get a master's thesis from David. They've been sitting around in the Center for Wetlands and I don't have a copy. So that's wonderful. And it's when I live here, when I live on the Ishtaki River. This is my uh, first year of graduate school. I lived on the Santa Fe River right next here to the Ishtaki. So I used to snorkel pretty much every day. Wonderful. And so I show up and I get some mail, right? So that's my landlord got some mail. And it was all about water lettuce cleanup. And, then, and so they were like, we're going to come spray the river, but then people freaked out. And so instead of spraying the river for water lettuce, we're going to do some harvesting of water lettuce, right? So, so this just completely changed my life, right? So I'm like, that sounds like a fun job. So I would go out and harvest water lettuce. That, that, that's what I did my first year here. What's interesting is I've still got this letter somewhere. So it said water lettuce is a non-native plant, uh, which has only caused minor problems on the Chattahoochee River. But the problem is, at least from the DEP's perspective, the stuff's floating downstream, causing issues in the swine. So my uncle works. This is great. I get to save the river. <laughs> and so at one time, right, this is from USGS back in 2011. It was classified as non-native. Right, so there's an interesting. Yes, that's right. That's right. Not class one invasive, right? Okay. And so this is a map, right? Fish Chucky streams. And so anywhere you see 2000 and 2001 where water lettuce was eradicated, that was me. I was really good at this. <laughs> Super good at getting water lettuce. We'd have all kinds of cleanups, we'd have volunteers, but I was out there day after day harvesting water lettuce. Okay, so right, here's what it looked like. We had canoes go up there, the water less, I find it, you know, get eradicated. All right. And then and then so I noticed one thing, right? So I started having some doubts. This would have been about March of 2001. I go into Devil's Eye Spring, a beautiful marvelous, just marvelous spring, beautiful eelgrass. I harvest all the water lettuce out. There's extensive population. And I kid you not, a couple weeks later, I go back and there's this algal bloom. And I'm like, hmm, what's my kid? <laughs> and so I had that thought. And then you can't make this up. So I'm in a class with Tom Christman. And then he says, there's a, a, he's like, we have the Einstein of ecology here. He's giving a seminar um, to be over at the Center for Web. There's HG. And so I go to this talk. And so HG is talking about the Everglades. And then the big man is like, Throwing all like you, you know the stuff's falling on the ground. He's got these transparencies. Just a great talk. And I'm like, I need to go talk to this guy. So I, I'm like, what? Well, send an email. And he says, meet him. You know, the next day. He's like, well, I'm going out to my wetland out on Hawthorne Road. So I show up. <laughs> and then, so sure enough, we go out there. We're driving, right? And he's got that old kind of beat up. It's like what was it? A white Toyota or something? Yeah. It's a, it's a Chevette. Okay, Chevette. It was a it's American made. It was a complete piece of crap, is what I remember. But then, so we're out from Trider, we're going off the road. It's me and H.G. Odom. He's asking me, he's like, What are you doing with your life? Well, I'm studying philosophy. He's like, What's great about philosophy is this and that. What's bad about it is they don't measure anything. That's good. Okay. And then, you know, and then he's like, well, What else are you doing with your life? It's like, Well, I'm harvesting water lamps, and this I'll never, ever forget. Because he's driving, and all of a sudden he looks over at me. Two things wrong with that. <laughs> but you drive, and then, uh, and then, and it's one is your whole premise that it's non native is false. There's okay, there's seeds. Okay, HT seeds, I think they're called. Um, and then they also say you're going to cause algal blooms. I'm like, this guy wrote books, I think, without <laughs> spreading. Yeah, so, so, so this made a huge impression on it. Okay. 
to buy this credit, I still harvest water lettuce for another, I don't know, like another like two months or so, but then I start having these doubts. I'm like, I think this stuff might be native. No, 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 no. Actually, this is my PhD dissertation. I'm just going to do a system model in the show because I did become a scientist. Slowly became a scientist. But if someone's going to tell you something's native, right, University of Florida, uh, H. Chioda might have been the worst person because he had these very controversial views about invasives. And so it was, you know, he wanted to plant native. You know, like invasives are great, right? So water hops, right? He loved water hops. And so water lettuce, he loved water lettuce. He didn't care if it was native or not, but he was the one that told me that it was native, right? The seed. Um, and I chased that MC. But then I did learn that William Bartram saw, right? So William Bartram, who's oftentimes looked at as the person that um, is like, what was native to Florida? So in the travels, he describes Pistia all up the St. John's River and in the Swanee River. And there's his drawing of it down there. And so, so that, you know, so, you know, back when I was the crazy water lettuce guy, but, you know, I'm like, where you saw it? Um, so then I had to move away. I just skipped ahead. So I can give an hour lecture on this. And I think I've got, yeah, like three or four minutes. Yeah, three or four minutes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. So, I mean, so then, so I was at the University of Florida. Then I went to UGA, right? And then, and so I went to UGA. And then I found it one day. Fossil plants from Bureau of Florida, which was from 1917. And sure enough, there's found there. But it wasn't a seed, it was a leaf. <laughs> so that was enough for me to publish a paper. And so I got this from, <laughs> from folks at the University of Florida were handy at me, right? So they're like, why didn't Bill Watt find it? Um, and it turns out Bill Watts did find it. <laughs> and so uh, this from Lake Annie, actually, this is in review right now. And, and so we're actually publishing this paper. Um, and here's another water lettuce seed from 13,000 years ago in Lake Annie. Um, and, um, and then, of course, UGA, when I published a paper, they were like, is this big? You have to add my cat. They stay putting in a newspaper there. Um, and so I made it into my hometown newspaper, right? Orlando said, but then I came right back to Stetson, right? It's right after this, 2014. And so uh, this is actually a graph that we're going to have in the new papers. So this is the Pistia here from Lake Annie. And this data, what's interesting is these folks went out and poured this. It was Eric Graham, uh, who actually just passed away in 2020. Uh, Watts passed away in 2010. So they poured this in 1994. And the reason why they never published it is they did another pour that was a lot older. And so they worked on that pour for Lake Tulane. And this one, Watts apparently knew that Pistia was important but they just never published it. So it sat around, and I'm guessing H2 and Perth is all I can guess. Because um, all the other plants that are in the core, they're all native, right? Every single one of them that was in the core is native. Um, and then so USDA was like, we're going to prove to you that the stuff that's in Florida, though, is actually exotic. So they did this whole genetics test. And here's the nice conclusion here. Springs are the repertoire of nativeness. <clears throat> <laughs> native Pistia genetics. So pretty much every spring in Florida has its own unique strain of Pistia. So, right, so this is all from HGO. HGO, right? HG, yelling at me, right? It's, it's great. And so, so actually, USDA is actually went overboard. Now they say it's native everywhere else. It's native uh, in New York. Uh, probably not. Um, so with that, thank you so much. Awesome. And thank you, David. Yeah. All right. I think the man deserves a question after that, right? Were there any questions for Dr. Evans? <clears throat> no, you nailed it. You nailed it. They all right. Oh, we got one question from, from Ronnie. I see a comment. Hey, was coming back to New Zealand and he brought some Cypress seeds from New Zealand with him. They said we're gonna play this on the court. <laughs> well, you couldn't have had a better setup, and then we're going to keep going to strength. We got Dr. Matt Cohen here. Thank you, Matt. Go for it. You may need to actually click on the link to get to that slide. You think it'll track that? Right. Afternoon, everybody. This is a real treat. I was a, a graduate student in the Center for Wetlands, the late 90s cohort with Mark and like 
80 other graduate students, I think. <laughs> um, and I want to talk a little bit about some work that we've done sort of channeling the, some of the insights, Dr. Odom, thinking about springs as model ecosystems. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to talk about what the Center for Wetlands has meant to me yeah. like, professionally. I actually turned 50 this year as well, which feels a little poetic. So we're, we're, all, uh, we're all aging the Center for Wetlands too. So when I arrived at the Center for Wetlands in, in 1996, um, it, I didn't have any idea what I was getting to. I really had no idea, but it was a really heady time. Odom had been ill, but he was back. Um, Mark Brown was in charge of a huge lab full of really interesting, diverse, curious people. Buzz Holling was here at the university and created a lot of uh, dynamic conversation with the Odin crowd. Bobby Lonowitz, who's retired here, he would come down here from time to time. Faye Montague was around, stirring the pot. Um, and it was just a really crazy time to be a student. And I felt just intellectually at home in a way that I hadn't felt as an undergraduate. There were a lot of students. We went to a lot of system seminars. Some of them were amazing. Some of them were really long. <laughs> but I'll say that like the thing that stood out to me about the Center for Wetlands was that it was populated by people who were intellectual on the moves. There was just no topic that was off limits. Um, and it was intellectually optimistic too, that there was room for new insights for any, from any system. And I remember H.D. Odom going over to the physics department and telling them they had the big bang wrong. <laughs> I don't know if they did or if he did or didn't. Uh, they did or didn't. But that sort of optimism to me was really in, contagious. There were a lot of parties. There were a lot of optimistic. <laughs> you know, you're stirring the pot when uh, when when people get mad at you. Right? Um, there were a lot of parties, a lot of canoe trips, a lot of volleyball games. Um, I was in the Center for Wetlands basement as a toiling graduate student before it was refinished when it was full of uh, rodents and. Detritus from years of uh, years of science. There's a great picture of one of the parties here with a. There's like this just the cast. This picture is amazing. So wow. Dave Tilly, who's serving out a high transformity fluid there, he's got himself a lot. In the back there, you see Mark Nelson, who was one of the original biospherians, locked himself inside the biosphere he dome, and so he was like, "Whoa, there's the wine. We didn't have that stuff on the inside." I don't know what you're doing, Clay. Um, <laughs> what am I drinking? <laughs> and I, I don't know. I guess I'm asking, is that all? Um, part of the attraction of giving this talk is being able to go through some old pictures. And I just want to show a couple of them of people who've become very near and dear to me. Because when you're in a cohort of that many students and you're in this sort of intellectual foment, it's really pretty amazing. You make deep connections. And so here was the, the studs of the Center for Wetlands. You see some people with a lot more hair. Mark Clark, Joe Pranger, Chuck Lane, BJ Bukeda. There's Alan Foley. And I don't know what he's dressed as. <laughs> we were on the side. Anyways, this was a this was the crew. Went out in the wetlands. Um, did a lot of a uh, lot of things together. Chuck, I don't know what Chuck is doing there. Um, these are people that have become pretty dear to me. These are the people I wanted to introduce my son to when he was born. So it's a kind of contact we were making, and it all really came from Mark Brown. <sighs> You know, Mark Brown was the glue that held it together. And I, this picture, believe it or not, is from the year 2000. And I want you to take a look at Mark now and look there and tell me if you see anything different. I don't see anything different. It's all the red one. That's what he says. His secret is, is red one. All right. So it was a heady time. It was really important to me. Um, and Odom was full of ideas, always full of ideas. And one idea has stuck with me. Um, all along, and it was, it was the idea of the macroscopes and the detail eliminator. So he had this idea that the environment was full of details that one really just, there are too many, I can't process it all. And so his thing, he learned this from, uh, from doing the, as Bob mentioned, he, was, he did uh, weather forecasting. So you have to look at the next, next larger system, just take a step back and try to, to eliminate the details so you can see the real, the real mechanisms. And there's somebody looking through the macroscope, having done that detail elimination, simplified it, tried to generate sort of conceptual model and then demonstrate general systems principles. And so I found an interview with H.T. Odom online, found a little clip that I thought, you know, he's being interviewed at the University of Kentucky. They're going to make us walk ads. I think not. <clears throat> How will these colors magnitude, these measurements, progress from lower and less complex levels to higher? So we don't matter the magnitude change. We don't believe there's any difference in complexity in the world. 
Fantastic. I learned that students by grasping the center is always the same for every possible. And so it's a matter of we see too much. That's why I got you in trouble with the social and the social analysis. So backing off and learning to simplify so we can make this into the second one to help do this. Now, when you how do these others of magnitude as we just made them? Go back to this. We don't want it to loop forever. I'm gonna let you let you drive. Let's see if we can figure that out. That's a profound. You don't have to do it. How flexible do you do that? All right, one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go here. You see too much. Let's do it ten more times. It'll it'll feel just as profound as this. So I think what Odin was talking about, and one of the lessons that I've taken with me is that you know we have to kind of approach our research and our interrogation of the of the world through the lens of model systems. And this has been the way that I think the, the best ecosystem science has been done for decades. Um, I, I'll call your attention to a couple of what I think are key papers over the history. All of these have been cited by thousands and thousands of papers. The one on the top is Peter Vitusik and his group, Oliver Chadwick, that basically looked at the lava flows in Hawaii that are of all these different ages, but they're all in the same climate. So all of a sudden you have different substrates ranging over 4 million years of different soil ages. And you can track things like how ecosystems succeed under exactly the same climate. It's a remarkable model system to learn things that are of value as you generalize to other systems. There's a work that Bruce Menji and others have done on the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, gap phase regeneration this is from work on Barrow, Colorado Island. So there was just an investment in science and thinking about a tropical forest as a model system. There's a very famous paper by Martin Sheffer talking about alternative equilibrium shallow lakes. So these are the idea that lakes can populate one of two alternative stable states. And I would put this paper, Odom's paper on primary production of flowing waters, amongst those. And, and in particular, the work that he did in Florida Springs. Um, and so let's play this, the second the second. Just a great quote. In fact, I was going to, I went to grad school and studied uh, the secret of life. You know. and, uh, uh, then I soon found, and this is by interest for us, my goodness, the secret of life is it's a system. And there's no secret, it's just a darn good system with very good self regulating mechanisms. And so, if you're going to study the principle of uh, theory of the system, let's get, go back to one where you can see the parts, work so hard to get the data. So we went back to the ecosystem then rather than the biochemical one, right? So different. That's in fact, yeah. I was going to, I went to grad school and studied. Thank you, Dave, yeah. for being technical support. Yeah, sure. It's a um, and I'm, yeah, tech is not my thing. So so what Oda was saying there is that the the uh, the value of being able to, able to observe the system in its sort of rich complexity, as Bob was talking about, um, and it springs in particular because the boundary conditions are stable. The water comes out of the ground. It's the same temperature. It's the same color. It's the same chemistry over months to even years. And it creates just an opportunity, a laboratory. And that's what I want to talk about for the rest of my time. So we're going to talk a little bit of, a little bit of science. So Odin basically was the, amongst the first to recognize that these curious observations that people had been making since the 1920s about the heterogeneity of dissolved oxygen in time. Evelyn Hutchinson, is, as Bob mentioned, was his advisor at Yale. Oxygen emerged from the group there as the, um, as the keystone variable. If you need to know one thing about an ecosystem, you should know the dissolved oxygen concentration. Now, diurnal oxygen signals had been noted in the literature before, but Odom took it to a whole new level. Right? He basically interpreted this daily rhythm of variation in oxygen as a measurement, a direct measurement of whole ecosystem function. And as he did that, he started off doing this in Silver Springs. He tried it in New Hope Creek. This might have been while he was at Duke. Uh, but New Hope Creek is a regular river, and it floods, and it has droughts, and it's not like a spring. And so it's not as easy to see. And so from the work that he did in the 1950s in Silver River and uh, across the other springs, he basically yielded what I think are two of the most important graphs in aquatic ecosystem science. This is one. Bob showed it already. This is a beautiful figure sort of illuminating the connections as mediated by energy where we have primary production, right? Plants doing the alchemy of photosynthesis and enabling all of this interesting and rich interaction and creating this sort of aggregate energy flux through the system that we call ecosystem respiration. And this is the base. So this particular graph is also amazing. He did this across a bunch of systems and showed 
that the variability in light intensity was the predictor of the variability in primary production. And that if you look at this line, it implies that ecosystems are roughly 4% efficient. They turn 4% of the photons that come in from the sun into, into biomass, um, grams per meter squared square per day. He says in this paper that comparison of the chemostatic properties of the strength, so he's referring to these things as chemostats, they don't vary. So this is why they're great places to study. Suggests that oxygen, phosphate, nitrate, carbon dioxide, they're unimportant to determining the magnitude of primary production. It's all about energy. Energy is the fundamental currency of ecosystems, the main controlling factor. And this has really enabled, I mean, we still do it the same way. Well, I figured this out in 1956, but you know, we have better sensors, we have better models, and you know, we've got databases, and we can do lots of things we couldn't do back then. But the basic logic of this model is exactly the same as it was. And I was part of a synthesis that was able to take. Now, rather than Odom, who could do three or four days because he was taking individual bottles and doing Winkler titrations, was super laborious. But now, just drop a sensor in the water, come back in a year, and you've got an incredible time series. And from that, you can start to construct a much more richly integrative measure of how metabolism varies across rivers, how it compares with terrestrial ecosystems, so on and so forth. So springs were the model system that has generated this just explosion in understanding about how ecosystem functions and metabolism. The second one that, that springs provide is that, you know, Odom's logic about doing this in the springs was that the boundary condition was a constant. So I could basically attribute, he, he argues, that everything that I observe downstream, I can attribute to the metabolic function that I have between the spring vent, where the, the signal is a flat line, and whatever I see down the bottom. And that's a very important thing. You can't do that in very many places. And so we were like, oh, it's a good idea. We should try that with some other things. And so we took some data, and what I'm showing you here is the sort of heartbeat of oxygen. This is exactly what Odom had seen before. Daily variation in oxygen, daily variation in radiation and temperature and all this other stuff. But we measured nitrate, high, very high frequency, right? So what we're watching here is the ecosystem using nitrate in real time. It's the first time I've ever seen any. It's all, and it's, it's exactly out of phase with oxygen. So as the oxygen is going up and photosynthesis is kicking in, the plants are assimilating nitrogen directly in proportion to the amount of primary production. In fact, if you plot primary production on this axis and uptake of nitrogen measured from the wiggles in that nitrate curve, you know, convince me I'm wrong, right? <laughs> it's pretty strong. Not only that, so this slope actually implies the stoichiometry, the coupling of carbon to nitrogen molecules at the scale of the whole ecosystem. No one's ever been able to do that. Um, we measured that. We got about 21 moles of carbon for every mole of nitrogen. What is cool about that is that's, that's at the whole ecosystem level. When you measure the carbon to nitrogen of the plants and the algae, it sort of sits on both sides. And if you've been to the Ishtucken River, you know that there's both plants, submerged aquatic vegetation and algae. So it works pretty well for nitrogen. It sort of sits right in the sweet spot for what we would expect. So we're like, well, let's try it with phosphorus. Phosphorus is a little trickier to do, you can see right here is the diurnal signal of phosphorus. There's a lot of interesting things about the high frequency measurements of phosphate. One of them is, it turns out that the ecosystem assimilates phosphorus at night, not during the day. And that's because it does so when it's producing new ribosomes and there's lots of sunlight doing cell division. Don't want to do that in the midst of a lot of UV interference. And so the whole ecosystem has their phosphorus uptake mechanism turned off out of phase with its metabolic architecture. It's a remarkable thing. Turns out we published this paper and the same year they showed this phenomenon in, in like in test tubes um, for marine diatomics, this sort of deep, this decoupling of uptake. And um, yeah, so this was, our test tube was the, was the Ishtakni River. So again, plot primary production versus uptake, pretty strong relationship, right? So basically the plants are assimilating phosphorus directly in proportion to their metabolic requirements, their carbon needs. And if we looked at the C to P ratio of the uptake, it's right in between the algae and the vascular plants. So very much the same. So what this means is, is that we can really understand the, the elemental needs of an ecosystem. And when we do that, so what is the, the so first of all, the uptake is stoichiometric, it's stoichiometric. It's directly proportional to what's living there and what its nutrient demands. And then we look at what is the supply rate of the nutrients coming out of the spring vent and running across the spring run. This is Sean King's work modified slightly taking the data. If we look at the ratio of flux to demand, so this would be the ecosystem using 1% of the available nitrogen and phosphorus. 
This would be the ecosystem using 0.1%. This would be the ecosystem using 0.01%. And what that led us to is this idea that these springs have a supply rate of nutrients that is many orders of magnitude higher than the uptake. And so the idea of, of the length of the nutrient spirals and the idea of nutrient limitation is really hard to justify when the, the system only needs 0.1% of the available supply. So then nutrient limitation, we went a step further. So springs are sort of a remarkable model system because they're chemostatic, because we can basically assume the constant. There's been a, there were a bunch of really impressive experiments back in the 1970s where they grew algae in test tubes, illuminated test tubes, and showed that as they modulated the supply rate of nutrients, their ratios, the plants were plastic, right? They adjusted their tissues in commensurate with what, what they were being fed. And that was evidence of sort of understanding the, the, um, the flexibility of plant stoichiometry, but also their, the, their nutrient limitation. And the theory emerged that when the, when the relationship between the supply rate, supply ratio of nutrients and the tissue is one-to-one, -one, that those are nutrient limited organisms. And when it's flat, those organisms are like people going to Golden Corral, right? <laughs> they don't leave Golden Corral because they ran out of food. Right? They leave Golden Crow because they don't need it. <laughs> Maybe they should have kept a couple of them. Um, and the springs are just an absolute um, playground for thinking about this stoichiometric behavior because they occupy two ketos. A lot of people will know what ketos are. It's so order of magnitude, at least two orders of magnitude variability in these molar, molar ratios. So the variability across the springs, the springs are constant, more or less. Mm -hmm but they span this huge gradient because of geological availability of phosphorus and anthropogenic enrichment of nitrogen that puts the carbon to nitrogen ratios, the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio spanning two or even three orders of magnitude. This is an unbelievable and untapped, in my opinion, uh, laboratory for thinking about general systems principles with regards to these ratios of nutrients. I had a student that went, collected the same taxa from 41 springs that span that gradient. And what she found was for both the sort of dominant nuisance algae and the dominant vascular plants, there was no relationship, right? We've been, we changed the stoichiometry of the springs by over three orders of magnitude in some cases across this gradient. And we don't see any change in how the plants are. So the plants are telling us, I think, that they, in these, these chemostatic systems, that they're satisfied. And so nutrient saturation of plant tissues is the only, I think, reasonable conclusion about these data. So I'm gonna wrap up with a, a sort of more local model system. And that is to say, how does the, the model system of the Center for Wetlands, I think the feedstock for all of this, all the science we're doing, all the, the heady stuff is, is funding. I mean, this comes in and it enables young, curious people to be indentured servants and live in the basement of Phelps Lab and, and, uh, and, and work on new ideas. Um, so there's all these graduate students. And in the case I tried to, I thought about putting in how many, I think you had 23 students. Um, <laughs> the crucible of that for me was just a lot of independence. Which I'm very grateful because it was, um, but it was a beautiful time. It was a lot of people, a lot of good ideas. And Mark and HDO were very much at the helm of that. And there were these sort of important feedback system seminar, uh, the classes that they, that Mark was teaching in ecological and general systems. And so this was the system that was housed in the systems boundary with Phelps Lab. Yes. Um, and it was producing good ideas. It was producing degrees. It was producing professionals. A lot of the people that I have embarrassing photos of are now, you know, pretty high up in the environmental protection leagues, which is why their most embarrassing photos didn't actually make the final <laughs> There's also, you can never forget the heat sink, right? So the heat sink, was so a lot of ideas too. With, um, yeah, zip drives, Bernoulli drives. There's a lot of, uh, um, a lot of hangovers. Um, so with that, also I think people that have thought about how did the Center for Wetlands generate this sort of heady productivity of, of these really sort of remarkable people. Many of you in the room, many, um, you know, paraphrasing notes, I don't think there was it was just a darn good system with good self-regulating mechanisms. It was a lot of, of generative ideas, creativity, and a lot of uh, skepticism and doubt that filtered out the bad ones. It was intellectually optimistic, it was omnivorous, it was very generous. And I think at the end of the day, um, my lesson to my students and other students is 
see generality in your system. That's what Odom was always doing. So I've been trying to look at the general principles that, that you could use to prove the rule elsewhere. Um, because basically every system you study, if you study it carefully, is itself a model system, right? That would have, you know, HT was always looking for the, the sort of kernel, at least in my experience, the kernel of, the, of, of how a system operated. And I think that is a really good lesson to, to end on. So that's a picture of the center of wetlands when I was there. For those of you who know that, that place now, you can see the tree arrangement has changed a lot. Thanks, man. All right. All right, we have a, time for a couple questions for Dr. Cohen. What's the nutrient status of Pistia stratioides? No, all right. Let me... Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, very much flow limited. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not an infinite source. That would be judicious for them. Any other questions? Yeah. All right. So I know part of the um part of this event is the time to be together. So I'm not going to shorten our break. So we have a break now. We'll be back here at 2 50 for Dr. Elliot White. And so grab some coffee, chat with each other, and we'll get started at 2 50, 14 minutes. Everybody online, we will be back here in just about 15 minutes. We'll see you back. Great idea. It really was. I was you know, I'm glad you didn't hear I wanted to go to the tap on your thing. A few of the students that said yes. Yeah. Can we do something different? It was a nice event there. It was just a work conference. It's like a party. That's what I'm going to do. Is I'm not going to be able to sign it. It's going to be Neo Wilson. Yeah. Good sign. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs>
All right, if you can take your seats, everybody. So I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Elliot White. Dr. White is an alumni of the center from, from my era. So um been really privileged and honored to work with Elliot since 2015. Um, and so Elliot's going to talk about coastal ball and cypress swamps or coastal swamps in the southeast and maybe around the country. I'm not sure. So. Just a stop. All right. So here we go. Elliot White. Thank you all. Uh, this is truly an honor. Uh, my journey to the Center for Wetlands started back in 2014 when I decided like graduate school is where I'm going to be at. Uh, and I decided wetlands were things that I really wanted to study and get to know more about. I had two offers to graduate school from the University of Alabama. One with David, came down, met the folks at the center, met David, and decided that this is where I want to start my academic career, my, my pursuit of a PhD. Uh, and it's been a terrific experience. I learned not uh, so much, not just about wetlands, but also about uh, systems ecology, systems design, and uh, Dr. Oh, Brown's general ecological systems class that I took with him was, I think to this day, the most transformational class I've ever taken. Uh, <laughs> it, it really did. Uh, it, it really did uh, transform the way that I think about the world and I see the world. And seeing actually that clip of uh, of Odom talking about the macroscope and complexity at different levels, those are things that I really try to uh, internalize, and that's the way that I now view the world: these different levels of systems and interactions. It's important to understand not only the components but the linkages. So I'm going to talk about some of my dissertation work. Uh, and because I, I have, don't have such a long history to consider, I can't go show all these photos of memories, but <laughs> I can talk about uh, some of the stuff that I did while here. So currently an assistant professor at Stanford University in the Earth System Science Department. Uh, and similar to the center, a lot of luminaries and long history. Uh, and really grateful to be there as well. So jumping out right to the devastation. Uh, these coastal swamps are really under extreme threat in the Southeast United States. Uh, in this 20 year time period, we lost over 14,000 square kilometers of them. Uh, a similar study came out at the time that we published this, this looking at mangroves across the world, and it found that only about 33,000, 3,000, 3,300 square kilometers of mangroves were lost in the same time period. Of the world. So, this is really a pressing issue for the Southeastern US. And when you do have these losses, you don't just go from a swamp into open water, which a lot of people assume when they think about sea level rise. You have this degradation pathway from a healthy swamp system to these uh, flush and scrub shrub systems. Eventually, you can transition. Sorry, to that's not my brother. Um, thankfully, I have to go back. <laughs> What's it? I have to stop uploading. It's not my fault. Mm -hmm. yeah, you eventually transition into these freshwater marshes and then open water. So this, this pathway is really important to understand, but it hasn't been discretized in uh, any clear way. And so we're able to show that as you transition, uh, about 53% go to scrub shrub, 24% to marsh, about 2% to open water. And then this final category of urban and agriculture. Many of you all were here in Florida before it went through this big boom, and you know a lot of our forces, what in general, were just converted into either new cities or kind of uh, transition into ag agriculture, but that was actually only a small subset of the decline. And these transitions are important because of uh, how we think about the cont continuity or continuity <clears throat> of ecosystems from the wetland areas all the way down to these ever systems. So 
Mark Brinson uh, did some work to conceptualize what those transitions look like through each stage of these ecosystems. I'm focusing on these uh, wetland forests. And a, a very big part of this figure is not that it just shows the different transitional states, but it also shows the things that maintain this particular ecosystem, the types of substrates that are important for their uh, sustenance. And then it also highlights factors that facilitate change. So you really focus on saltwater intrusion into these freshwater areas. But this is a very uh, Clementian view of succession of you have set ecosystems that transition from one to the other. This is a more Gleasonian view of ecosystem or wetland transition. Uh, so Arnold Vanderbilt, who I was very fortunate to have as a mentor in my undergrad year at Iowa State, uh, put out this paper in 1981, so many years before I was even thought about, uh, <laughs> that uh, showed that okay, you have some wetland vegetation, you have an extant wetland, but you have this environmental sieve around it. And in this particular example, guys, whether it's flooded or not, it's a state change. And that environmental sieve acts to allow certain things in and keep certain things out. And so something I really start to think about is I spent so much time with the Swanee River, at no point can you really say this is where there's a distinct change in the ecosystem. It's all subtle shifts and gradients in response to some type of environmental pressure. But that is not to say that what Mark Brinson put out is wrong in it. And so something that I really saw and started to think about is, is there a way to marry these two views of wetland succession ecosystem change? And so to kind of show that a little bit more explicitly with coastal forested systems, you have these kind of transitional states. And once again, this is a more Clementian view of you have this, and then you have that, and then you have this, and then you have that. And the Gleasonian view, if you have spent any time in the Suwannee River, you start up here, this is around Manatee Springs, and as you go toward the coast, you see this solo transition. So it's not as easy to say this is a <clears throat> this is a distinctly different state from that. And I started to think about, okay, well, what are the drivers, the environmental drivers that these systems are referring to? And once again, this is all along a river continuum. And then it started, I started to think about, okay, if you're a wetland all the way up here in the upstream parts of the watershed, what's really dictating a lot of things going on are the dynamics of a natural riverine system. So these large seasonal flood pulses, and they're also freshwater based. As you go down the coast, you get into more coastal or tidally influence, uh, influencers. So you have smaller uh, diurnal changes in the water level, but it's also heavily salinity driven. And there's a kind of theoretical equilibrium point where these drivers are kind of matching each other and the system is responding to both of them. But what we know is that climate change is disrupting this hydrologic balance. So you have decreased rainfall in the upper watershed, which means your seasonal flood pulses are changing. And then you also have accelerated sea level rise, which is not only increasing water level, but increasing salinity of area. And that's also throwing off this equilibrium. So where things uh, equalize along the river is changing very dynamically. And we do have ways to describe kind of succession or, or wetland forest development in the different parts of the river. So in more upstream areas of the river, we typically describe them using shade and flood tolerance. So their ability to tolerate being shaded or to tolerate high flooding. It's been shown in the literature that that really dictates what species and growth rates you get in the upper parts of the watershed. But as you go down the river, salinity is the, the biggest driver. But you can see on the left side here that I have this really uh, big black line. And it's to really talk about the fact that we don't think about these systems as continuums. People who study the upper reaches, this is what I study. I'm the bottom and hardwood forest. And then you have people who study kind of the, the more lower reaches, the tidal freshwater forest. And then you have people who work along that gradient, but we don't think about these things simultaneously. And so what I really started to think about was, well, there's some reality where you have these shifting forces either side. How can we actually marry those two? And so put together this conceptual model of uh, floodplain forest transition. So on the x-axis, you have distance with zero being the coast and uh, going this way, you have some distance further upstream. And then there's some equilibrium point in the river where these drivers meet. And on the y-axis, we have successional drivers. So uh, 
north of that equilibrium point, shade and flood tolerance should really dictate what ecosystem or what type of uh, wetland, forested wetland you're in. And then lower down, you have saltwater intrusion salinity. And as you transition from this more riverine influence wetland, you have some sort of pathway that you're traveling down until you get to these tidal freshwater forested wetlands. So this is the, the conceptual figure that I really saw <coughs> to test. And so we're able to do this, leveraging some old USGS reports led by Helen Light out of the Tallahassee office. And they went along the Suwannee River and characterized the floodplain forest in the mid-1990s. Uh, uh, mid I also did a lot of hy hydrologic work. And most importantly for me in my dissertation and I guess ultimately in my career, was all of the transects that they established, they recorded uh, where they were. So they had GPS components. They recorded the specific species that they went out and measured. So it allowed me to go back, find these transects, and actually remeasure the same forest, look at recruitment, look at species coming in and changes over time, uh, and do an exact one-to-one -one comparison. The sites that we selected were at three different uh, points along the river. So this is in Manatee Springs. This is in uh, the Lower Swanee River National Wildlife Refuge. And this is uh, also in the National Wildlife Refuge, just around the town of Swanee or Pierre County. Data collection, so talk about these transects. These are 10 meter bell transects. Measure uh, every tree on the transect that is 10 centimeters DBH or greater, and also recorded the species. Uh, there's a lot of data for this. <laughs> this is the best way I've found to summarize it. Uh, and the main takeaways is that some of the things that you would expect to decline over time did decline. So stem count, density, those things tend to decline as forests mature. DBH increases, which you would expect, but DBH is only significantly greater at the upstream site. So these sites, although there was some growth, the growth was very stagnant. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much longer on this slide because it's, there's a lot to, to talk about. We talk a little bit more about size class recruitment. So many of you have seen uh, pyramid charge population, pyramid charge country. So it's the exact same concept. Each of these is a band or age class starting at 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters DBH. On the left, we have what was recorded in the 90s, and on the right, we have my measurements. And then this is a difference between the two. So negative numbers represent a decline in that particular size, size class and positive representation increase. So starting at Manatee Springs, you can see there's a huge population of uh, 10 to 15 centimeter trees. Most of those are gone, but what you do see is that there's recruitment. So trees are continually getting bigger, and moving up in size class, and there's a significant difference between these two populations. But as you go down the river, you don't see that same growth. So uh, focusing more on this uh, aspect, you see there's some increases in size class, but there are also some decreases. So there's some trade-offs. You're not seeing this consistent recruitment of the size classes. And the same pattern is true at the furthest uh, south site, this, this uh, site near Suwannee very little change between the two time periods and they basically look like mirrors. And I say this kind of further downside is in arrested development. It doesn't have the ability to really actually grow and uh, have recruitment, increase its basal area, et cetera. So taking some of that ecological data and also the tolerance of every species that we found or environmental tolerance of every species that we found, I use PCA to ordinate them in relationship to the three different drivers, so salinity, flooding, and shade. So of the 29 different species, these are the three different clusters that were uh, that were statistically found to be important. So you have this cluster here, uh, which are species that are much more driven by these more uplift process, uh, processes, so responses to flooding and shading. Uh, these, this cluster here, are much more driven by salinity, and that's actually most dominant driver. So you have some species that are not very shade tolerant there, but are because they have strong salinity tolerance, they still survive. And then you have this orange or this green cluster, which is more of a transitionary stage. So these are species that don't do super great in any of these, uh, don't have super high metrics with any of these tolerances, but they are found in all three of these locations. And this is, I'll get there in a second, but that's actually really important. And so what I start to do now is I use this, uh, this metric called importance value. So it's a, a metric often used in forestry, 
as a way to combine all of the different things that you can measure into one uh, stable metric. So importance value takes into effect uh, the number of individuals, how often that they're found in a certain location, and also their size. And for each of these clusters, I looked at how that uh, how the importance value of that cluster changed over time. So starting in the 1990s with the solid line uh, to my survey in a few years ago, I guess, <laughs> in the dash line. X-axis is distance along the river and Y-axis is port value. So you can see that as you move down the river from the most upstream site to the coastal site, you get a decline in importance value for this specific cluster. And as I said, this cluster is most responsive to shading and salinity tolerance. So this is what you would expect as you are in the upstream section where riverine dynamics are important, flooding, flood response is important. That's where you have the highest importance uh, for this particular cluster. And then you move down. Two minutes, okay. Three. Three minutes, Thank you. okay. Uh, then you have this transitionary ecosystem, which over time <clears throat> is declining in tolerance, which my way of interpreting this is that as these as this system is responding to climate change, their species are having the uh, being weeded out effectively. And so if you're this transitionary cluster, you're not really strong in anything. And because of that, it's easier for you to be transitioned out of the system instead of being able to hold your ground. And finally, we have what I call this coastal cluster, which as you can see, as you go down river, the importance of that has increased consistently over time at each stage of our ground. So I have this theory on the left, I have data that I'm gonna show on the right. And with that data on the top uh, is where cluster one species will land, on the bottom is where cluster three species will land, and I did a ratio. So the ratio is the importance value of cluster one divided by the importance value of cluster two over time. <laughs> cluster three, yes. And so I'll, I'll step you through that. So the solid line, once again, is 1996. The dashed line is my survey. And this is that ratio uh, in the 90s. So you can see that the shade flood tolerance is the dominant factor in the upper, street, upper upstream portion. And as you go downstream, that increase or that switches to these more uh, salinity driven things. And that has changed drastically over time. So these uh, sites closest to the mouth river where salinity is strongest are becoming more driven by salinity over time. Uh, and excuse, excuse just a quick question. I apologize, it's hard hearing in my hands. Huh? Um, <laughs> all of your, your sex are in tidal areas. The lowermost one is tidal. The middle one is uh, tidal, but it's not very strong. And then the Manatee Spring site is only tidal during really low discharge. Where was the freshwater tidal boundary? Uh, from the reports, it's just, well, this site is freshest, but from the reports, it's about 50 river kilometers upstream of the mouth. So, and this site is at about 42 river kilometers, a little bit north of that. I have another comment. We'll have some okay. questions. Yeah, we can yeah. definitely talk later. Uh, so the takeaway is that really want to put some work in to understand how these gradients transition over time uh, along the river reach. And that's important as we think about management for these systems. So the Swanee River, as most of you know, is a free flowing river, no locks or dams or anything really to hold back the flow. Not all rivers have that luxury. So this is another river <laughs> working on the Natchez River in Texas, in Texas. This is a saltwater control barrier. So the Natchez River gets really low water levels sometimes. They lower this barrier to prevent saltwater from going up. And that those types of structures are going to be critical in how these ecosystems actually are able to transition in response to environmental tolerances. Uh, and I'll skip through all this. The main thing is that these coastal forested wetlands are extremely vulnerable currently and in the future. <laughs> Got to continue the first spot of sciences. Uh, progress takes the same effort. Follow me on Twitter, maybe not for long. Email me or go to my website. Thank you. Thank you. So we will take uh, a minute for questions if if you want to ask that question for, for Elliot. I get a little nervous. People relate to me to global warming when we're talking cycle. I'm not saying I disagree, with you, but in a freshwater pilot, you would have a pattern, salinity, 
what we were the other day used to call the Lena Big Pop. They got a big name. It's like eight feet in the head. Earth goes around the sun, the moon goes around the earth for 18 years. Actually, it's about that. Point. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's what we That kind of some sparks during that cycle. That's the parts. Both of them have to go. The other parts, there's a tidal difference. It's closer together. So, after doing a lot of work in the Santa River, which is much more tidal than it's gone. You see salinities of grass coming up and it's some part of the cycle. Mm -hmm. And if you look at if you don't have in the state of Florida, you have to have so I think we could just keep us on the agenda. We'll we're gonna take that to the happy hour okay. five minutes <laughs> later and we'll talk about the 18.6 year Yeah. Um, so we're gonna give a little bit of round of applause. Dr. Quinn Montague with the, he has the yeah, props. There's him. Uh, this is about to go forward. That's the point. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm going to have to refer to this because I only have 15 minutes and uh, usually I have 50. So, yeah. <laughs> We're going to keep you to it, too. Yeah. I'm Clay Montague and uh, I've taught here for 30 years and I've been retired for 13. So I don't know all of you yet. Um, the Center for Wetlands has always been where those of us in the systems ecology and the wetlands ecology programs uh, came to interact with, not only with each other, but also others with similar interests from across the campus and beyond. It's a center uh, for systems ecology as much as it was a center for wetlands. And uh, for the first 22 years of my 30 years here, uh, that interaction included Special Insights of H.T. Odom, who was one of the world's first and most accomplished systems ecologists, founder of the Center for Wetlands, and for whom it is now aptly named. At the at Wetlands and Systems Seminars and student faculty committee meetings, uh, my understanding of ecosystems was challenged and enriched and connected to society. At the Center for Wetlands, I learned principles of systems, of all energy systems, uh, but especially ones that include people. I learned about wetland engineering, including how to engineer wetlands, how to automatically cleanse our waste, and how to manipulate ecosystem succession to restore wetlands faster. And I learned about the value of natural work and how to place it on par with people. And I learned about that pesky, but inevitable second law of thermodynamics, which incessantly degrades energy, structure, order, and organization to be offset only by continual work. And finally, I learned about uh, to appreciate the dynamic whole earth system bustling for billions of years with processes of geology, climatology, oceanography, biology, a world system that re recently added us people along with our systems and of economics and communication, but all of it powered by sunlight tides to the internal heat of the earth through complex networks and cascades of energy transformations. I've learned a lot. I missed it. But today I want to pay tribute to H.D. and Betty Odom for their book, Prosperous Way Down, Principles and Policies. Here's my copy right here. <laughs> you can see a picture of it. It has a lot of tabs and underlines in it. Uh, the book has some cartoons in it. The far side captures uh, some of my motivation for wanting to learn from this book. World population is now 8 billion. It is still growing, but it should climax in a couple of decades. The book deals with the certainty of a future population decline. Not so far off. This is a very touchy subject. If you've tried to talk with others about population decline, I suspect you've found that it's indeed a tricky matter. Taboo. Even. But for people to be prepared, this story must be told. The Odoms treat it with compassion, frankness, and scientific principles. 
According to the text, the book took over 20 years to write. Apparently, it took a long time for the others to figure out how to tell people what they said. This book is a brain teaser. The development of principles is intriguing, the policy is provocative, but for me, the book becomes most persuasive when I start to grasp how the policies arise from the principles. A Prosperous Way Down was published in 2001. H.T. passed away in 2002. The world population has grown by another 2 billion since that time. Today's rampant concerns for the future involve an entangled mess of four great environmental problems, overpopulation, resource depletion, pollution, and despair. A Prosperous Way Down is about positive action, yet also about the inevitability of population decline, mainly because resources are so diminished and yet continue to be depleted despite the backlash. This book has me looking at all our major social and environmental problems through the lens of overpopulation. For me, it's ironic how that explanation comforts me. It's like finally getting a diagnosis for a serious disease. It might help you too. <clears throat> As we approach peak population, assets per person will decline but they could actually increase during descent, as suggested in a simple simulation of world assets. The red circle frames the transition period, the gap between these two lines, assets at the top, <laughs> assets at the top and um, population at the bottom. That gap represents uh, the assets per person. And you can see it shrinking at first, approaching a period of lower standard of living. But then eventually it grows. The take home message, if we voluntarily reduce population ourselves, then we can ease into the future by way of a prosperous way down. This cartoon shows the economy riding away, ready to descend. An, alternate, an alternative is an apocalyptic way down, in which population plummets from starvation, disease, and destruction from natural disasters and war, during which we lose much of our assets and can no longer rebuild as much due to a lack of enough energy. About such brutal means, the Odoms write, quote, it could be argued that these are the quickest and thus most humanitarian ways to get down for a long period of rebuilding and restoration. But this book proposes that a prosperous descent, gradual descent, is possible and better if we can learn. The policies are based on a set of basic principles. Energy is the ability to do work. Some energy is lost with every use. That's the author of an act. All work on Earth is ultimately powered by sunlight, tide, and Earth's Work is done in, in all of nature, not just by people or living things. For example, sunlight makes wind, rain, climates, trees, and crops, and people cut trees, harvest grain, and make furniture. And people, and, um, and the tide, excuse me, and the tide enhances production in coastal ecosystems, and people harvest fish. And um, deep heat in the earth builds mountains and accumulates minerals and fuels. People mind that it wasn't fuels. We pay people for their work. We get the rest of nature's work free if we don't interfere. Contributing is essential. For a population to survive and thrive, it must contribute to the system that produces it. Or else, populations are eventually replaced by others that contribute better. That's the second. That's the uh, the law of natural selection. Most of all, these processes do not depend on people. They operate regardless of what we do. We just might not like it. We're advised to work within their constraints.
Yodens rely on the concept of emergy, spelled with an M like emerge. Dogbert here explains a key. That's, well, that's Dilbert, but Dogbert's a little dog. <laughs> Dogbert explains a key emergy notion. Dog, by the way, Dogbert is said to be the smartest dog in the world. <laughs> All things are created by a combination of we're less capable. Energy is the amount of Earth's three energy sources needed to make a product or service, some sort of asset. Energy quantifies the true value of our assets, what the Bloom's call real. Transformity is the energy per unit energy in a product. Transformity predicts the power, influence, and capability of product or service. Energy synthesis traces all the work involved to supply an asset. The energy of work, both by people and without, is added up to suggest the true value. This is a fundamentally important <laughs> summation because most of the work isn't done by people, but rather by huge and numerous natural processes. Since people are paid and the rest of nature isn't, classical economic theory woefully underestimates the work needed to make the things independent. We simply can't afford to do all that work ourselves. We don't command enough energy. And anyway, nature is doing it for us if we simply do not interfere with it. So when energy accounting is incorporated into economic theory, a lot of human history and current behavior can be explained and future trends anticipated. Guidance for a future population descent becomes more sensible and realistic. That guidance is how the prosperous way down really shines through. One conclusion from energy calculations, by far information has the greatest potential influence on the future. It has, it has the greatest transformity of any asset analyzed using energy. DNA and RNA formed and refined through many millions of years of life on earth carry the instructions for making all living things. Language, images, music, books, computers, et cetera, carry our these are the most powerful things we have produced, and mostly with the help of fossil fuels, which themselves took millions of years for Earth to produce before we ever came along. In fact, our accumulated information is the legacy of the fossil fuels age. We need to protect all of it. We don't know now what all will be needed during descent and long period of restoration follows. The energy of information is so high because it took so many millions of years of Earth's energy to make it. The transformity is so high because it takes so little energy to hold and carry information, reproduce it, and spread it over a wide area. This Jim Boardman cartoon shows one kind of information carrier. It's interesting. It's like a portable 500K file. And you don't even have to download it. And, and you say it's called a newspaper. <laughs> so what about the guidance? It requires attitudes to change about uh, taboo subjects such as birth, sexuality, <laughs> death, economic growth, international relations. Here's a sample. No unwanted children. Enjoy your nieces and nephews. Legal abortion is essential. Use ways to handle libido that don't produce children. No wasteful use of energy. Yodems rail against overly powerful cars and other expressions of status made through being wasteful. Tolerate exotic species. <laughs> they work quickly to help restore ecosystems damaged by years of overuse, artificial fertilizers, pesticides, and paper. Provide less health care, but provide it across all income levels. Universal basic care is important to keep people healthy and contributing. Damage, excuse me, <laughs> but extraordinary end of life care is wasteful. Full employment, except across the board pay reduction to keep all your co coworkers. In. Governments can institute uh, public works programs like we did. Expect shrinking, shrinkage of the economy, smaller businesses with pyramidal management levels, reductions in the number of huge events, 
like concerts, football games, comic con conventions. Oh. <laughs> Expect uh, an economic shift from competition for growth and market share to a more cooperative competition for produ production efficiency. Cap personal income around the world at two hundred sixty-seven thousand dollars per year. I wonder where they got two sixty-seven. I got it from one hundred fifty, and then I, I got it. This is about my bringing it up to today's two hundred sixty-seven thousand dollars. A multinational military force could dole out remaining fuel in proportion to the In international policy, more votes would be given to countries with the most real wealth. Wow, God. this is just a sample of the kinds of things in this book. For me, it seems like every paragraph gives me something to find. Migration. The Odoms traced today's migration to unequal trade relationships that provided far more value to the developed world than was perceived to the donor countries, mainly for their exported materials of labor, which have high coverage. Is that the trickle down there? <laughs> 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 so now developed countries have cornered much of the world's resources. Desperate people are trying to get to where the assets are. It might be more efficient to set up factories in those poorer places, send in all the needed materials and supplies, and then pay a fair price for the products. It would have been best in the first place to trade on an equal energy basis. Worldwide communication. <laughs> Rather than covering the world with trash talk, the Odoms recommend using our fantastic ability to com communicate cheaply around the world to encourage a worldwide set of shared values, to make beneficial dissent a global pursuit, and to foster international respect, cooperation for global sharing of resources. So in conclusion for me, the major lessons of a Prosperous way down are make beneficial dissent the collective purpose of this century. Consolidate knowledge for long-term preservation. Nature could so survive without me, but I couldn't survive without nature. And plan to start again. During the low energy restoration that follows dissent, we start again after staring at the rubble. Thanks, H.T. and Betty. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Clay. Go ahead. Um, I'll start with you with the slides, right? Thank you. Severely mm -hmm. disappointed in, especially of the Sierra Club failure to address global population is the single reason we have global disaster. Um, in my opinion, the single besides uh, the moral decision to not have children, to not procreate, the, the most important thing people can do is to be vegan. At be least vegan? at this point in time. All right. Yeah. I have a question for you. It's okay. Yeah. I yeah, so thank you very much. And I, I wish that message. Yeah. I think uh, a prosperous way down is what HT's life work is about. And I think he, his caring for the future of humanity and based on a broad understanding of natural science and, and his system's view of the world. And I think uh, Betty Odom is co author and is, uh, at the very least, uh, his translator and partner. <laughs> and I think she's fully grasping sometimes uh, esoteric ideas and then using her career ability to explain science, but she skillfully brought powerful principles and policies to a lot of things. Um, I also have a question for you. If people around the world started to talk with each other about universally shared values, what do you think would be discussed? And I have a suggestion here from a colleague that was recently honored uh, and in his acceptance speech of the honor, 
he gave his personal philosophy. It said, you know, you all know this person too. He said, personal philosophy was kindness, acceptance, compassion, truthfulness, love, and that his professional uh, <laughs> philosophy was harmony with nature. Thank you. <laughs> so how many of you were my students would you please stand up don't raise your hand you need to stretch your legs go ahead stand up stand up there you go all the old ones right all the old ones i'm not sure they don't stand up anymore all right well thank you for how long Robin? <laughs> Some of them were students a long time. By the way, we got a t-shirt truck for you. I needed that. I tried to find that t-shirt. I was going to wear it as an undershirt. I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> find it. The problem is, over the years, so many washings, it kept getting smaller. Is that what <laughs> So we've had a lot of fun. So let's get serious. Yeah. And actually, it's going to be the reverse of that. My, um, let's see, I don't want to. So I was lucky. I went to the University of Georgia. <laughs> okay, go dogs. So did Clay Montague. In fact, we were there together. And uh, then I migrated down south to the, the University of Florida. Go Gators. Okay. <laughs> and my son is a do go dogs and go gators person too. He sits right there. He's supposed to come here beside me so I can pick yeah, on him. But that's okay. Here, say so natural progression to go to the Florida. So you move up, you move into Florida. So that's definitely. <laughs> you know, I really love the quote that Theo Wilson gave, and it was basically, uh, "Science is fun disguised as hard work." <laughs> we had a lot of fun at the Center for Weapons. Part of that fun came from all of us living in the same house. <laughs> we lived at the center. And we went in the field with each other. The other part is the <clears throat> University of Georgia. I was at the University of Georgia. Didn't get my feet wet until I crossed the streams at the bottom of the mountains. I live in the mountains now. So I crossed the stream at the bottom to get my feet wet. I never got my feet wet because I went to the Oaks and Swamp. And I was doing some research in the Oak Brook Swamp, funded by the National Science Foundation at the University of Georgia. There was a guy there named, I can't think of his name, I think it was E.P. Odom. <laughs> E.P. Odom and his brother had had a little falling out, and they were over a decade that they didn't even talk to each other. The second phone call was, as it was told to me by H.T., was from his brother. I got just the guy for you that was in a flat. So E.P. Odom sent me down to H.T. Odom at the Center for Weapons in 1979. Fantastic, most wonderful opportunity I ever had. 40 plus students in the years that I was at the university. Who did we have to start all over again? <laughs> uh, no, you just keep, you just keep okay. talking. So I'm getting down to the fun part. If we can get down to the slide again, I'll get Okay, all right, all right, all right. You know, we had somebody who qualified. You know, back in, and think about it, 90s, 80s and 90s. How many of you had an iPhone? <laughs> really? You couldn't take a picture with your iPhone? Neither could we. So we have slides, okay, because all of my slides, all the chart slides, are, 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 are pictures of slides. Larry, thank you for... Bringing some of the slides. Okay, we wouldn't have some of the slides if Larry hadn't at least had the opportunity to convert some of the slides. Anyway, we're out. All right, we got your video, but they're not seeing your pretty face, but that's okay. We're going to go to slides. <laughs> we'll do that. And so my PowerPoint presentation is my. There we go. You're good. Go ahead. Okay, here we are out in the field. This is a. I think Orlando Lovelace, I'm not sure. Uh, like and line. Question was, uh, we came out of spot and swamp one time, and I said, now that's a like and line. <laughs> Anybody remember that? That's a like and line. Yeah. Anybody recognize that? So why do you go into wetlands <laughs> college in the first place? I mean, you know, snakes, they're just cotton mouth. You see the, see the mouth right there? 
That's yeah. all you see. Pete, you come, yeah. come. We walked into the uh, gum swamp. We walked into the gum swamp, the Oak swamp. There were nine of us. And Pete was part of the crowd. He walks up, we take our sampling stuff. Oh, look at those snakes. Every mound had a snake on it. Every mound had a cotton mound. That's right. We he slowly sink. He doesn't sink, so we slowly him. backed out, went back to that site two weeks later, right, Pete? <laughs> and of course, whoops, I'm going to draw traction. Okay, that's the way we go. And of course, you go into wetlands because you want to wrestle with alligators. And we always love our favorite state bird. And that was before the damage. And I always made a comment. Yep, I had a winch on the front, and you can one on the right passenger side, too. But anyway, I always got in trouble. I don't, I don't, I don't. And we would go on our field trip. Didn't we have some fantastic field trips? I mean, how can how the hell can you learn about wetland ecology without getting up your ass and alligators? Okay, you can't. You can't. Okay, so we'd head out to go for the swamp. I told them, you're going to have a fish jump in the boat. I guarantee you, every time in every boat, that's five minutes already. My goodness, you want to change, change, change your clock. It's going to be bad. And here we are at the Oakbrook Swamp, standing on a floating island. You know, these peat nests jump up, and we stand there, and as we talk and our lecture, and we talk about weathers, he goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And deeper. <laughs> And all the students are looking around. And deeper and deeper and deeper. I said, guys, you know what's underneath that island, don't you? You know what? You see, you recognize the people there? And of course, everybody knew me my fifth helmet. I wish the hell I could find that fifth, uh, fifth helmet. I don't know who threw it away. <laughs> I don't know who threw it away, but I'll, if you find my fifth helmet, I'll give you a dollar for it, okay? Anyway. <laughs> so I wore my fifth helmet off. I said, you know why you wear a fifth helmet in the swamps? You go through these briars and brambles and et cetera. I didn't carry a machete. Alfonso did that. <laughs> I didn't carry a machete. I would just put my head down and barrel right on through, okay? And I didn't, you know, so that's what I thought it was for. Now I got Larry to step out. There's Larry, stay, step out. Can you go? I said, Larry, go and grab that plant. He steps out. <laughs> 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 Uh, and of course, you can enjoy it by just get too hot, just sit down and enjoy life. Now, these are some of the slides taken by a fantastic method. I needed a, uh, what do you call it, a uh, slide to uh, digital converter. So I was talking to Clay Montague, and he said, Yeah, I got one for you. I'll bring it to you. And he said, So he said, I use the uh, slide projector, put on the screen. And that's my slide to digital converter. <laughs> I said, fantastic. You can tell he's a George Tech grad. <laughs> so we had to slide the digital converter. Then some of these are distorted because that's what I used. I got down to the last three slides. Guess what happened? The ball blows. <laughs> I sure do wish I could track down my buddy. Anybody recognize any of these stuff? So well, not only do we have two fun, living in the same house, enjoying everybody's company, sharing the research, going in the field with each other. That's where we enjoy the science. Science is hard work disguised, fun disguised as hard work. So we have a guy who just retired from Fish and Wildlife Service who became the regional director of uh, Wetlands Restoration for Fish and Wildlife Service. You know, he did the stuff first on the East Coast and he moved to the Denver area. I don't recognize this guy right here. It's an ugly you know, beard around the park. He ended up moving up to Indiana. He ended up moving up to Indiana, Rob. Yep, and he worked, and you know, hey, now, damn, talk about getting set. He, part, he was part of a five member of company, the guys that owned the company. They sold the company. He's happily retired with a lot of money. But anyway, <laughs> and now, so he had field trips up to the Natahaley River nine years in a row, and I just said to the students, we're going to be on the Natalie River uh, kayaking, canoeing, and rafting joints and playing volleyball, and we did that as well. Anybody recognize anybody here? Not your best. Bill Dunn, Pete Wallace. Look at Pete back in the back. 
Sorry, thank you. Two students. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Good. Mike Miller. So we went up to the mountains of North Georgia, North Carolina, on the way to Dismal Swamp. That's where Pete looked by picture. We stopped at mom and dad's house. Yeah. No, I'm doing okay. Stopped at mom and dad's house. There were 18 of them. There were 18 of us. There were 18 of us that went up there. My mom fed us a big thing of uh, uh, vegetable soup. Pete saw a picture of me on the wall when I went to high school. Uh, at uh, military high school. Fuzzy vest. Fuzzy vest. We stopped at picking his nose. We had to stop at picking his nose. Um, anybody know Gumby was? But anyway, we had a good time. And not only did we have fun, we fell in love. <laughs> so this is a long time ago. I said, yeah, I need to get a picture of the value of wetlands. So you have the value of wetlands, cypress knees, knee sitting, and double knee sitting. <laughs> <laughs> and look at that next slide. <laughs> look at that next slide. Yes, we had a lot of fun in wetlands. So that's the end of my part of it. Sure. <laughs> All right, we're going to have a technology change. We're going to make a. We're going back. We're going back in time. Technology. First, we're going to reset the new technology and see if we can get the video back. And then you're going to set the old I'll technology. Do, I'll do. Well, same. I can do these. It's ways. in the same vein. No science. So. Rest easy. So everybody online, we are going to an actual slideshow from a slide projector, and we're going to try to get you to come along with us as soon as that meeting owl turns back on. <laughs> There it goes. Yes, good. We'll spotlight you. Good. We will. Already said it all. Hey, I brought a prop here. How many people pick bugs? Bithic invertebrates. Yeah, I'm going to have to get you to do Maybe this one, actually. We did now. Yeah. Go for it. You up there and say hello. All right. Anybody see themselves in you? Where's Pam Latham? Where's yeah. County Versa? Pam's actually in Tallahassee. Yeah. I tried to get her to come. I was texting her yesterday. Where's Francie Gross? Where's County Versa? Yeah, I'm <laughs> Go up there. Go up there. I'll, 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 we all know who that good looking guy lives. Florida's big tree. There's Debbie. There's a cute guy. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this? Who's this? I'll be looking at the snakes. <laughs> Oh, look at that. Okay, so who's baby? Who's cute to baby? You pinned? Yeah. Yep. Down in the basement. Yeah. Here we go. Misery in the basement. We shared the same house, didn't we? Yeah. That's the other misery in the basement. <laughs> That's a turtle. That's probably with Appalachia Cola and uh, picked up a hog nose snake. That wasn't. Oh, <laughs> oh right. Here's what Larry said to him. They were Appalachia Cola. Pick me right. It was a pick me right. Larry Schwartz. What did Larry say to him? Drive yourself to the hospital. <laughs> 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 they keep you start driving. Exactly. That's just collecting. Steve Flanking. Steve Flanking. Steve Banks. Rob there's your favorite car. Uh, <laughs> she told me to do this. She said, I need a photo of the soil core. <laughs> so I laid soil. down by the soil core. And there we are coring in the o Ocala National Forest. And that Ocala. So uh, everybody knows what DBA is, right? So in class, someone said, that's the best, what's DBH? 
And I told her, stand up and I'll show you. <laughs> but DJ on me is up to here. <laughs> I said, no, it's 1.3 minutes. Okay, so what were y'all thinking? So it looks like, look, 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 look. Looks like uh, Robert's trying to pitch into the HD there. Yeah, and the Bob net. in the back. Volleyball net. Isn't that you, Bob, in the back? Anyway. How much time we got? That's a long time ago. That's tiny bird box. First sign. Snake in that tree. <laughs> and I don't know who this. After they get some scoring, you gotta be cyclists. They have machetes in their teeth. They're what with machetes. You have a picture. This is, uh, is this the, the year professor, Shrani, wasn't it? Seven words in his life. Yeah, yeah, he was so good. That was that big plug we had up at the, uh, what was it? Where was it? Yeah. Osceola. Osceola, yeah. Oh, is that Alfonso on the left? I don't think it is. No. Yes, we had a lot of fun there. She has had a good DVH, 1.3 meters. Ah, Bill Dunn. He won't. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the ones that started last night. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. We had fun and enjoyed life <clears throat> and worked very hard. You want to share your garden stories about Lonnie while it transitions yeah. back again? <laughs> By there were never any embarrassing stories. Uh -huh. <laughs> Give it to the Come on, Debbie. Yeah, let's go. Please. That's a good one. That's excellent. All right, so if there are any current students in the room, this is, we don't approve of this. Wallace, you couldn't be a current student. He's a, he's, he's a mentor, right? Yeah. Oh, please, yeah, please do. So, that much more, we've been up there a bunch of times, a bunch of times. Um, Larry and Pete were charging us. <laughs> so we're supposed to meet them up under we're supposed to meet them up at and they were gonna come along fish. We all packed in like sardines in our one table, and then they had their own stuff. And they told us to get up there by I think 8 p.m. 9 a.m. some ridiculous. I don't know, we're around time, and uh, all there. We left a note 
the ground there that said that uh, we waited. The guy didn't show. Must be muni communication error. So we've gone back again. That's so right. we moved the truck back in, you know, around the corner. Well, he hit it with his way. So those guys showed up a little bit later, got out of the car, looked around, finally saw our nose. Nice. <laughs> 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 Oh, you want to tell a story? We should have gone. I don't. Uh, you don't. We'll do it later. We'll do it the happy hour. All right. Well, I want to close out by by sort of observing something, which is that a miracle occurred in this room. Well, two miracles. One was that we got all of you back here together, so probably for the first time in a long time. The other miracle is, I gave Ronnie and Charlotte thirty minutes, and they did it in twenty five. <laughs> so I just want to I just want to give a kind of a review of what's been going on at the center, basically kind of where Mark left off, where I was able to uh, have the opportunity to start working at the center. And so a little update of what we've been doing now, and maybe a little discussion of what comes next. And um, I'm hoping you know some of y'all are at US, a lot of you are you know dispersed all over the the country or the world, but start a little bit of discussion about what it even means to be a senator nowadays and maybe continue this discussion into tonight and tomorrow. So I just wanted to look back and I um, looked at the old documents and found the mission of the Center for Wetlands. So I'll just read it. The mission of the Howard Theodore Center for Wetlands, provide sound scientific knowledge about wetlands that lead to a better understanding of their role in a sustainable partnership of humanity and nature. You have heard that partnership humanity and nature many times, systems ecology, ecological engineering, the center works towards this goal by conducting, facilitating, and coordinating interdisciplinary research and teaching on wetland-related resource management issues. And so I think this mission was written probably even before some of these pictures. I don't know if you recognize yourself in those pictures. I have a hard time, you know, mapping those to you guys. I'm not sure. But I thought, you know, research and teaching, research and teaching. And it made me think about teaching about wetlands when I talk about what is a wetland. And research and teaching made me think about defining a wetland like this wetland plants and wetland hydrology, but does this look like a complete definition of wetlands to all my yeah. friends here? No, right? We got our special three-part definition of a wetland, and it made me think, what is the role or what is what makes up a center for wetlands? And I thought research and teaching, of course, are critical, but this outreach piece that we have done some of over the decades, and I think we kind of need to do a little bit more of, because I think a lot of the challenges, there are scientific challenges, and there are always an education mission, but some of this, what's missing, the questions we had today about what do we do with all of this knowledge and intention, I think is an outreach mission. So I'm going to suggest that we update at outreach here. we got Dr. Clark always doing outreach every day that he is here on campus and, and uh, out there. I'll talk a little bit about it. All right, so this is going to be a whirlwind tour of recent research at the Center for Wetlands. And I want to start back where Mark left off with this, uh, the National Wetland Condition Assessment. And as I was making these slides, I realized, probably as you did, Mark, that Every one of these, the research outputs are, you know, they're important, but really it's built on these people, the people who have come through the center and the people that go out and do work now in agencies, consulting groups, and in academia. So we've got Kelly Reese, Alexa Panella, Caitlin Mraska, and Dr. Joshua Estee, who just recently got his PhD with Matt Cohen. We went back another year of NWCA, another 60 or 70 sites, and some of the take homes here kind of follow on what Mark showed before. And this is the work that Kelly Reese was able to add with a little add-on contract from the FDEP, looking at LDI, looking at Florida wetland condition, looking at LDI and sensitive species. And the take home here is really reinforcing landscape scale development intensity as a driver of wetland function. And particularly that above some threshold, you get sensitive tax of being extirpated from the system. So a long sort of continuation of decades of work, many wetlands, the only way we could do that. 2021, we got the project uh, again, and I wanna give hats off to the field crew later, Alexis, AJ, who also was the crew leader for all the decorations. And this year we were able to partner with the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and go out again to another 50 or so wetlands and buck around and get this amazing data set. The take home here is that for just in the Florida participation, we've got 176 sample events, amazing data about the water, the plants and the buffer area around wetlands. And it's a, a publicly available resource combined with all of the other nationwide data on wetlands that's available. 
So then, okay, we got a lot of data and we got a lot of information about what this, but we continue to be sort of challenged by this idea of weapon protection, Clean Water Act, jurisdiction, all that. This is a project I work on with two great alumni, Matt Cohen in the room and Daniel, if you're out there or watch this ever, and asking the question about how these isolated weapons sort of affect downstream water resources. And this was built on a lot of field work that Daniel had done, that Matt had done. And the question became, did geographically isolated wetlands actually affect landscape hydrology at the broader scale? So in a very Odin sense, there was a lot of field work, nature, actually observation, building up into landscape scale models. And of course, you know, we published an article about this, but I think what was more impactful was that this was cited in the EPA connectivity report, trying to figure out which wetlands deserve jurisdictional protection or not. The take home really being that yes, these geographically isolated wetlands buffer the base flow, the superficial aquifer, and that they provide the significant nexus that the Supreme Court says was important. And also that small wetlands, maybe we all know this in this room, but small wetlands are really critical. Taking a bunch of small wetlands off the landscape and replacing it with one large wetland, probably not gonna give you the same function, even thinking about Clean Water Act jurisdiction. All right, so then we've got the wetlands and they sit in this matrix of uplands. So again, work continued on with Matt Cohen, some others, we added some more folks to this. This is about Acharya, amazing fuel crew, forests all over Florida, trying to understand how pine forests use water and whether we can think about forest management as water resources management. Okay, another big model, a bunch of data and a paper. The idea being that, yes, in fact, we can predict how much water is basically provided by an ecosystem as a pretty simple function of the biomass or the leaf area, the climate aridity and the hydrogeology. And I think the take home here that has been pretty powerful, and Matt, you've spread this gospel around, is that um, maintaining low density pine forests, and it doesn't matter the species, yes, we all love the palm leaf, but maintaining low density forests is a strategy for increasing water yield. Water yield, and that water yield can go to the aquifer, it can go to streams, it can go to wetlands. And then we sort of getting curious, like, well, what happens if we do get that extra water in the wetlands? So moving on, now adding Nate Jones, who's at the University of Alabama now, he was a postdoc with Daniel. Kevin Henson, my student, and Dr. Carol Haas from VT. Someone told me this was the most Odom title that they had ever heard. And I know I came to UF in 2005, so I did not have a chance to meet um, Howard Odom. But of course, like the legacy looms in the building, in the boots, in the mud, and in all, all of you. So this idea that we could take a from salamanders to greenhouse gases, does upland management affect public function? I won't go into it, but we looked at the water, we looked at the greenhouse gas warming potential of rehydrating wetlands by taking the basal area down a forest, and we looked at the amphibian habitat potential, and yes, there are trade-offs. We can reduce upland forest ET, which rehydrates wetlands, which actually improves amphibian habitat, that's no surprise, but that increased overall global warming potential, mostly because of methane production, even though CO2 respiration went down. So the idea that we could connect uplands to wetlands, to habitat, to global scale phenomenon, again, a very you know, sort of macroscopic lens. So then my student Kevin was like, does this act, because that was all a model. And Kevin went out to Austin Carey and looked at some burned forests, and some cleared forests, and tried to understand, do we actually rehydrate the wetlands? And Kevin, if you were supposed to come to this thing, I could bother you about publishing this work because it's really only in a poster form right now at the Water Institute from like four years ago. But yes, prescribed fire, decreased evapotranspiration, increased wetland hydro period, increased water yield, and the same went for thinning forests around these wetlands but only nearby. And as you move farther away from where the thinning occurred, that effect. So we could start to put these into really real practice out in the field. All right, uh, keeping a focus on restoration, current student Renee Price looking out. Y'all remember the Tampa Bay Water Wars. This was probably from your era when you were at the center. Wetlands drying out, huge amount of pumping, and then it went down. And Renee's trying to answer the question, did those wetlands actually get restored over time? <clears throat> Some basic metrics say they have, but we don't even really know if we can call a reference wetland a wetland. So she's going out and trying to understand whether reference wetlands are truly sort of, you know, fungible, this one equals that one, and whether passively restored wetlands are recovering and being stable over time. So I don't have a take home from that, but spoiler alert is not all reference wetlands are the same. Again, I'm sure if you've mucked around enough, you all know that every wetland has a sort of unique identity. Okay. So a whole other body of work that you saw a little bit with Elliot was this idea, we're in Florida, 8,000 miles of coastline, and the coasts are in extreme transition. So we wrote this paper with Elliot thinking about whether we restore wetlands that have been saltwater intruded or whether we retreat and thinking about the major drivers of ecosystem transition and saltwater intrusion, 
He did a bunch of remote sensing work on this, trying to understand those large patterns that he showed you across the Southeast, 46% decline or whatever the number, 13,000 square kilometers. And this work was also um, advanced by a student of mine, Katie Gladzik. Katie, I think, was going to come. But I don't anyone see Katie. So she's here at UF. She's working now again with Dr. Matt Cohen, looking at the impact of roads on saltwater intrusion and ecosystem change, and also looking at the loss of these coastal hydric hammocks, these iconic sable palmetto juniper islands off the coast, and finding them really strongly, their loss strongly dictated by things like their elevation, even the shape of the island, high perimeter to area ratio is a lot of edge, and these wetland forests are being lost. That's work that Amy Langston, who's in the back there, advanced for her dissertation, looking at the continual decline of these coastal hydrochemics. This work was with Dr. Jack Putz and published a couple of papers on, you know, this iconic ecosystem. All of Eleanor Blair's paintings all around Gainesville of that beautiful sable hanging over, right, and turning into this kind of ecosystem. And we're seeing this casualty of climate change, which is an ecotype being lost in Florida. Well, we think about field work, and then we zoom, well, we start with a conceptual model, like I showed you, then we zoom into the field work, and then we zoom back out. And this is again from Elliot, looking at the spatial scale, the temporal scale of natural and human augmented climate change and saltwater intrusion affecting coastal ecosystems. So the take home here being that naturally and anthropogenically exacerbated saltwater intrusion are reshaping our coastlines. And ask, we have to ask the question, do we restore these things? Do we aim to restore these things or do we retreat or watch that adaptation occur? All right, one more thing about these coastal transitions. It's this idea that we're also experiencing much warmer winters and we're seeing a tropicalization. Amy wanted to know those islands are dying. So what's gonna come there next? So we went out and we put a bunch of well, mangrove populules out there, and we want to see if they did very well, right? And Amy was a biologist. She should have known. I, I'm a dumb engineer. So I was like, yeah, we'll see if the things grow. We'll measure the salinity. We'll measure the water depth. And then, um, let's see if this is going to work for me. Then she caught this video. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you got this. It was just sheer luck. And there we go. <laughs> so, so working with Dr. Christine Angelini, so a coastal ecologist, started to think about it's not just abiotics, bottom-up stuff, dumb environmental engineer, but it's also biotic and top-down. And she wrote this paper called Predation Restricts Black Mangrove Colonization in the Northern Range. But then we're like, okay, but I'm like, all right, field work is great. Amy was great at Quadrash. She only got lost on, or stuck out on the island one time when the canoes got washed away got rescued by Kenny in the airboat. But then of course, what do we gotta do? We gotta build a big model. So this was a, a model of effects of trees, of biotic predation control and propagule basically availability and looking at, you know, how are, this, how are these ecosystems gonna transition and what are gonna be the major constraints or, or uh, facilitators of, of mangrove expansion as winters warm. Well, luckily enough, I was able to continue to work with uh, Calvin Kang, Yiyang Kam, who's in the back there, I'll partner with Mike uh, Osland at the USGS, and looking at winter temperature regime changes as a really strong predictor, not just of the mangrove extent, but every characteristic of mangrove ecosystems. They're above ground biomass, the height, the number of sinks. This is work that Calvin is doing right now. I'm not going to talk about any of these graphs, except to say the soil changes, the above ground biomass changes, the species composition changes, and we're able to project into the future what the coastlines of Florida might look like. Just like with the saltwater intrusion, climate change induced warming, especially winter temperatures, are, are radically changing what the coastline looks like. And that means all of the ecosystem services from carbon storage to wave attenuation to, you know, what critters, if you're fishing for snook, wet, wet, or you're trying to get like, uh, you know, Atlantic silver sides, you know, nursery, like bait fish population, really makes a difference. That was all the wetland stuff that we've been working on. But my group, just like Mark's group and just like Ronnie's group, we work in rivers, we work in forests. Couple of quick snapshots. This is the work that Nathan Reavers, Nathan, so he probably had to go pick up his son, but this is the work Nathan did in Silver River. We turned the river red a couple of times with this dye, uh, learned the technique from, um, from Matt Cohen, and also did studies to try to understand that phenomenon that Bob Knight was talking about, that algal proliferation. And Matt told us there's way too many nutrients for it to be nutrient limitation. He gets in fights with people about that all the time, right? And thinking about snails and oxygen, and we were looking at hydrodynamics or water flow 
And that was the work that Nathan did to show this sort of hydrodynamic control on algae and springs. Um, I think I'll take you here for just a minute. It's a kind of fun video of what we did on Silver River a couple of times. Uh, we, had to, we had to get there. There's Trey, there's Erica, Nathan, Elliot. I don't know if there's the headlamp on. Um, it's only so often you get to like dive down to the bottom of a mammoth spring and shoot rhodamine dye into the water. We had to get there by 5 a.m. because the park ranger was like, this better be clear. <laughs> like 10 a.m. So we, you know, we didn't really know the residence time of the spring ball, so we just guessed. <laughs> they did a pretty good job. I can't remember the name. The drone guy showed up. He's like, can I drone video this? We're like, yeah, that sounds good. We didn't, yeah. It was self-organized. Um, that was the plume. And we use these to understand the residence time and sort of the transport phenomena in the spring. But it's really just too cool to not show <laughs> So you can see there's the clean, like, you know, the, the fresh water coming out, <clears throat> NGDs, and there's that back channel, the Fort King Waterway. And we tracked this all the way down the spring run for, for two, three days. We camped out. It was not good sleep. It was not at all. We had three boats running up and down the river taking grab samples. And this, a lot of this was in, um, but we turned the river red and you can see even where, you know, seepages and side parts of the, of the channel are not getting mixed with the main. Uh, water body, and I'm, you know, I'm supposed to keep time with myself. But... <laughs> Perfect example of Theo Wilk, scientist. It was super fun. It was, and you know what? Like Nathan planned the whole thing, and you know what? I, I brought the food. I brought the food. <laughs> there was no beer that I, <laughs> but all the sandwiches and everything, right? So that's what the good advisor can do, right? Let the student lead. Make sure they're fed, hydrated. All right, so we'll we'll, we'll move on there. Um, did a lot of work in the Amazon with uh, a lot of partners in South America, in the in the U.S., funded uh, in part by the University of Florida Water Institute, a big interdisciplinary graduate student cohort. Um, I won't talk too much about that. And then current work with something called the Center for Coastal Solutions here at the University of Florida, looking at the drivers of things like coastal water quality decline. A really cool paper that Dr. Miles Medina led last year. If I asked you whether humans had a footprint on impacting red tide in Florida, I think a lot of you would say, duh. Um, and then a lot of you might say, no, it's an oceanic process. But for the first time, we were able to provide some quantitative evidence of anthropogenic pollution exacerbating sort of the, the uh, or accelerating and exacerbating red tide in Florida. So, and then people, of course, went off and ran. Right? A lot of NGOs went off and ran. So, and there's more. This is my lab. And this is something I, wanted, I talked about with Mark. There's the Center for Wetlands. And when you were here, there was the center. And it wasn't the Mark Lab and the Odin Lab and the Clay Lab. But nowadays, things are in the same lab. It's one that you got your own lab, the Marsh Sustainability Lab, right? You got it. So, you know, we have this challenge. Elliot, you got your wetland ecosystem. I saw you have a logo. It's one of the challenges of doing center type research. Huh? Anyway, how about the education mission? So y'all know we have the wetland certificate. We've got both the certificate and the concentration of wetland sciences. We've been trying to revamp this recently because it's um, everyone and their mother has a center and all the qualifications for centers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So you can attract more and more people to pay you for less and less, right? So you get less and less of a degree. It's been hard. We have our core wetland research, the, uh, the wetland seminar. We have Dr. Clark's class, what wetlands of water quality, hydrology and biogeochemistry of wetlands. Those remain the core. And then you have all these other courses you can select from. But I have to say, interest in the wetland certificate is not extremely high. We get about two to three students a year earning the certificate. And there's a couple, I, I asked, you know, maybe think about some reasons for that. One, where's Mark? There he is. Well, there's this guy, right? So, so in water and ecosystem sciences also has a wetlands and uh, water resources certificate, right? And I said, sometimes I think, well, we should just let you guys run the certificate. But then I look and it's like, it's also a water science class. I say, no, no, we need the interdisciplinary concentration. Well, in sciences, but I must say, y'all are attracting about five to seven students a year. And so it's something to think about. What is the role of a center in providing a certificate versus a department? Um, so we'll move on from there. A lot, we've really expanded the footprint of the seminar. And this has started with the help of Dr. Sharon Sweeney and other alumni and with Megan Sam. You think about 50 years of seminar, 50 years, 100 semesters, about 1,400 seminars that must have occurred. It's, easily the longest running seminar series on campus, like by far. We have 33 semesters of recorded lectures, 
about 10 of those years, Mark has to find on some Bernoulli drive somewhere. Uh, we do have about, if you can find those, which I think do exist, about 450 recorded seminars. Again, easily the largest repository of water and wetlands like recorded seminars that make it could make its own online course in education. And um, since 2000, we've been on, oh, I got to say also, this is kind of the, the profile. These are just this semester's speakers and um, starting with Sherilyn and now with Megan, really trying to make something that you can share, that you can put on social media, you can really attract viewers. And what's the whole viewers thing is we've been on YouTube since 2000. Yeah, anyone can go, you can have your own YouTube, probably some of your kids have YouTube channels, I don't know. But we've actually had something like 23,000 views on YouTube since we started, and it's growing and growing and growing. And so we're getting this expanded footprint of wetland science out into the real world. Um, and we meet this education mission everywhere. Oh, I gotta say, so where's Debbie? There you are. So this was when I took wetland treatment systems in 2007 from Dr. Knight, and we went up to this Hardyville, South Carolina, if I'm not mistaken, and we got to um, go into that Cypress Dome that's been receiving wastewater since, since the 80s, I believe, right? Okay, 99. So there's Bob. I could only, that's the only photo I have of you. It looks like kind of lurking in the background, but it was a very transformative course for me, and I now had the honor of being able to teach it every other year here at UF. So then Sweetwater Wetlands, first wasn't even open yet. I got to take my class there in 2013. We also probably took the last field trip ever to the Waldo Treatment Wetlands, which oh. no longer exists. So Waldo now sends its wastewater to Gainesville. Oh. And just a huge, so uh, uh, on 301 for years, it was just conduit, conduit, conduit. And now he, he this guy, I cannot remember, I think his name was Randy. He joked like, well, now, when you, I won't do the ask. Now, <laughs> when you flush the toilet in Waldo, you can race your poop to Gainesville. <laughs> but then I checked with, I don't know, it was Jones, Ed, did you guys run that line? I don't know. Um, it takes four days for the poop. To go. So <laughs> you can get there. But, you know, um, then I take my students back now to the Sweetwater Wetlands, and it's just an amazing educational place. And to see it, you know, evolve and self-organize and adapt is going to be great. Got Mark out in the field here, always doing outreach, education, and teaching the world. And here's Mark's trips to Africa, and we go to South America, and Brazil, and Costa Rica, and Panama, and we try to meet that education mission. All right, sure, we're going to, I don't want to talk about this last part that I think is fundamental is this outreach. And the outreach isn't just on the professors and it isn't um, just on your PR folks like do awesome social media posts, but it's on all of us, students, the rest of the whole, the whole works. Um, I found this amazing YouTube interview with Matt, Samuel Pocket or History Projects. So I suggest you check that out. Of course, Dr. Clark is always as an extension, as a, having an extension appointment, always doing work to get this news out there. And then doing educational things like bio blitzes and other sort of student led, you know, like Ronnie said, you can't learn about this ecosystem unless you're out. There. So we try to organize events around being outside. A lot of my students get involved. So this is AJ doing the Black and Marine Sciences YouTube. My students going on World Wetlands Day. We presented, uh, and that was in the Faradabad Millennium School in India and other places trying to get the message about wetlands out. Um, and then this is in, uh, in Panama with Ivana and Andre. Uh, spreading the word about wetlands or wetland ecosystem services around uh, uh, Santa Maria watershed. I saw this um, headline, and I know it's referring to someone in this room. I don't know who it is. I didn't want to call anyone out, but so the idea that not only can you go and like, you know, lead a class or a tour, but you can talk to, you know, you can talk to the press, you can put your science out there, you can add some context and some Sort of science credibility to these articles that are coming out. <clears throat> and I want to just talk briefly about this one sort of amazing opportunity that we had, which was in 2019, the Supreme Court heard the case about whether discharging polluted water into groundwater was covered under the Clean Water Act. It was an, out of Maui. It was the Lahaina Wastewater Treatment Plant. Lahaina has been in the news a lot because of the recent wildfires. But the question of does the Clean Water Act apply to groundwater? And this was a chance to kind of do really like civic engaged public outreach. And it sort of fell in my lab and I decided to, to say yes to it. And it's in Hawaii, but the idea of surface water, groundwater connections is pretty obvious, pretty no brainer for us to be thinking about here in Florida. And so here the Center for Wetlands and others got to write a science brief, a friend of the court, a, a Michi Curie brief. And it's an actual science brief about how groundwater works, how it's important to surface waters. Um, 
and a bunch of lawyers, including from Stetson University. You might recognize Royal Gardner. He wrote the Lawyer Swamps and Money book, excellent book. And he came out and said, hey, we need a bunch of scientists to, ruck, to explain to the justices of the Supreme Court how groundwater works. And I was like, ah, I'm not a groundwater specialist. I'm sort of, you know, generous. He's like, well, that's perfect. Can you explain it to, like, explain it to like a really smart undergrad? That's a really good challenge. So we have four authors, scientists, four scientists, and then a bunch of scientific organizations that sort of co-submitted this brief. And we literally talked about things like storage and flows and chemical tracers and put pictures like this and then wrote it almost like an advanced high school or you know early college level for the Supreme Court justices. And like, I thought these people are not gonna read the science brief, but maybe they, you know, a little bit pessimistic. <clears throat> but the case went seven to two. And where there's a significant nexus or an important connection between groundwater and surface water, you cannot discharge contaminated wastewater into groundwater. And so Stephen Breyer said from the bench, the scientists really convinced me they're geniuses. <laughs> they can trace all kinds of things. <laughs> and I said, well, I was... <laughs> when, I, I mean, I, when, I, when I meet any, like that's obviously, it's like the pinnacle. Yeah, the papers are great, you know, we discover things, but when we yeah, you get something in a report, it's one thing. But to be there was a little green book, and I, uh, I can't remember the science brief, and it was in the hands of these nine justices, and at least some of them read it, and it went seven to two. Yeah, we fixed the the groundwater loophole in the Clean Water Act. All right, so what's next? Beers are coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the Sackett case would be on our minds if we're thinking about policy regulation or environmental science, or you know, wetland science. And whether, you know, Florida is kind of safe because of uh, the way we regulate wetlands here is a little bit better than in some states or we have some state regulation. But also we have this big change in how Florida wetland permits are being applied for and being written, right, from the Army Corps to the DEP. And this is a timeline of Army Corps wetland permits. And then this is when the DEP took over and the bar is how many permits have been granted. So you need to see this is really good news because the backlog has finally cleared up. You can see this is really bad news because permitting for wetlands is just kind of like just a stamp. It used to be a really slow stamp, now it's a faster stamp. I, we'll, we'll see. And then this idea that we are continuing to face just like kind of unprecedented crazy growth. I found the book, the, uh, the book that Odom contributed to the by Governor Askew, Florida 10 million. And now we're Florida 21 and a half million or something like that. And just promising more and more and more. So a lot of challenges. And then on the other hand, we have these movements like the Florida Right to Clean Water Act, which you know you can sign the petition for. Maybe we'll get on the ballot. We have things like the Florida Wildlife Corridor. We have the Southeast uh, Conservation Blueprint. We have all of these conservation initiatives. And regardless of your politics, if you just quantify the dollars spent on conservation, there are a lot of them. They may not be sufficient, but they are ranking in the billions and billions of dollars of conservation directed funds. So there's sort of these two competing, I don't know, uh, trends going on right now. Obvious continued environmental degradation, but a lot of concern and a lot of fun. So it's a time to be thinking about how do these unprecedented pressures on our natural resources play out? One thing I've noticed is that, I don't know if it's just at the university and DEP or wherever, we have this unprecedented expectation we're gonna have our cake needed too. We're gonna figure it out. AI is gonna figure it out for us. We'll be able to make a balance or a set of trade-offs that are you know, mutually agreeable to everyone. I think Bob's looking at me like, yeah, right. <laughs> so I think it's something to think about um, whether we push back against that narrative. Um, and so that makes me think about which part of our mission, the Center for Wellness mission is really the most important moving forward. And also hearing all your stories about the center and about the sort of, collab every project I ever run is collab with interdisciplinary collaborative, da, da, da. But everyone has their own thing. And if, redefining or defining a heartfelt center for wetlands. It's in a department, I think is a real challenge. So we can talk about it over beers, but the idea that maybe Mark, Mark, others of re reassessing that department in a center model, it just, it, it's hard to get other people to contribute to some other college and some other center. Um, so I don't think we can meet the challenges in the mission uh, without rethinking. Okay. So what's actually next is our, okay, so it's our happy hours coming up next. So you should go to Boxcar Depot Park. I've delayed you long enough. It is um, not far at all. 
But I'm going to put up my cell phone number and Mark's cell phone number. If you need it, if you can take a picture with your phone, you can call us if you get lost. Tomorrow at four is the barbecue at Mark's house. Call him if you get lost. I so when you're still up there, your GPS doesn't work. It does work. We don't need to. The problem is just punch in the address, which is down here, Bob. 2124 Southeast, 30th place. <laughs> and the GPS will take you. I learned how to train Google Maps. <laughs> because for uh, I lived out there for five years. No one could ever come use their GPS. Finally, I figured out how to train um, Google Maps. It was quite soon. I went there and I said it was my home. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. Address. Does it work for everybody or just you? Yeah. And then Sunday is the trip to Chittucky and, um, and uh, Bob Knight was kind enough to offer that after the trip, everyone is welcome to swing by the um, Florida Springs Inst the Springs Welcome Center. Florida Springs Welcome Center. Um, and we got a count of about 20. So uh, if you weren't included in that count, but you want to go, just let Bob know. Sure. All right. Um, so that's what time do you four o'clock at Mark's tomorrow. The four o'clock. Yeah. And then you really need to show up by the by about 8.30. 30. It says 9. That's when we split, take off. So you want to be there by 8. It takes 40 minutes. 45. Yeah. We'll take out where the tram is, like where the tram takes you back to the southern uh, entrance. So it's the longer of the two trips take out. It's lower. Yeah. And they won't take out the camera. They don't deal with all the time. Right. 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 Yep. But they take care of it. Yeah, but it, we, we did a field trip there recently. They tried to take out the camera. They did not. They won't do it. And that is it. Thank you very much for attending. For attending. The rest of the weekend is all of the fun and games. And so enjoy it. I really appreciate everyone making the trip and sharing their memories. No. Well, the question is the foundation. The foundation is part of the foundation. Also, the one has been part of the um, hey, so David, it's been yeah, a good pleasure to get a little bit here. Yeah, have you brought all weekend? Uh, no, it's just yeah. the end. Oh, I have got the end. But I think it's funny. Yeah. Oh, great job. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. 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 But the work is mighty great, working all the way through. Thanks, Lon David. That was fun. Hey, yeah, yeah. Awesome. thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's good to just hear all the history. It's always a thing a lot, but it's funny, you know. It's like, yeah. You're here from the mountains, you know, and they did it. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. At the end, we just try something.